just give it one minute for everyone to come in from the waiting room. As a reminder, please mute yourself as you enter. Good afternoon. This is a hearing before the Boston Cannabis Board. Today is Wednesday, October 14th, 2020. As a reminder, if you are not presenting or testifying, please mute yourself. Today's hearing is being conducted pursuant to certain temporary amendments to the open meeting law. That is what allows us to meet virtually. The hearing will be recorded and will be posted to the city's website. Before I review some procedural matters, I will introduce Chairwoman Kathleen Joyce. Good afternoon, thank you for joining us today. Um, I am joined today by Commissioner Lisa Holmes, Commissioner Darlene Lombos, Commissioner John Smith, Commissioner Alejandro Sankian. Thank you. Please ensure that your respective video and audio are functioning properly. Each applicant will be given 10 minutes to present. Jasmine Wynn, the board's project manager, will notify you at the five minute mark and the two minute mark. You will be muted if you go over the allotted 10 minutes. Following the presentation, if the applicant is an equity applicant, attorney Chayla White will present regarding the equity certification. After each presentation, the chairwoman and the commissioners will have the opportunity to ask questions. Following the first round of questions, the board will accept public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Following elected officials, individuals who requested to speak will be called. Following those individuals, any individual who is indicated via the chat function they wish to speak when called, please clearly state your address and your affiliation, if any. Testimony will be limited to the specific application being considered and will also be limited to two minutes. You will be muted if you go over the two minutes. Additional testimony may be submitted to the board in writing. If you are giving testimony that is duplicative of the previous testimony, please state that. Following public testimony, your woman and each commissioner will be given the opportunity to ask any additional questions. As a reminder, the chat function should be used only to request to testify. No questions will be answered via the chat function, nor will any written testimony be accepted via the chat function. Please refrain from sending private messages to any of the commissioners as they will not be answered. Written testimony and any questions should be directed to cannabisboard at boston.gov. Calling the Grayson Group, LLC, the proposed license premise, 533 Washington Street. The license type is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. This is a certified equity applicant. The date of initial filing was May 10th, 2019. The date of filing when the, with the Inspectional Services Department was July 9th, 2019. The date of the community meeting was November 25th, 2019. The presentation team consists of Cheryl Clyburn Crawford, owner and managing member, Steven Sweeta, owner and managing member, Derek Small, owner and community liaison, Edward Dominguez, security consultant, Michael Ross, attorney, Daniel Glissman, attorney. This applicant does have a buffer zone conflict and has submitted the, re the requisite buffer zone statement pursuant to the board's rules and regulations. As a reminder, when considering whether the proposal is appropriate regarding time, place, and manner, when located within a half mile radius of an existing establishment, the board applies the heightened scrutiny defined in its rules and regulations. Is the applicant present? They are. Yes, Stephen Suda is present. Cheryl is having a little difficulty logging into the Zoom meeting uh, this present moment. She thinks. 8771. Correct. Michael, Michael Ross, can you please forward the link to Cheryl again, please? We are having difficult logging in. We've been trying, I've been logged in, she's been trying to log in for the past 10 minutes, it is not working. Yeah, well, why don't, <clears throat> why don't I start the presentation? Yeah. I guess, um, Attorney uh, Delaney Hawkins, uh, do you want us to wait for Cheryl? Do we have the ability to, uh, uh, to change the order here? Or would you like me to just begin the uh, presentation on her behalf? Would you like to defer your presentation? Um, if, if we're able to do so at this hearing, um, otherwise I'll go forward with it. We can take a second call. That would be great. We appreciate your accommodation. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Morning. Sanctuary Medicinals Inc. The proposed license permit is 253.55 Belmont Street. The license is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is a non equity applicant. The date of initial application was July 17, 2018. The date of filing with the Inspectional Services Department was July 17, 2018. The date of the community meeting was March 5, 2019. The presentation team consists of Jason Friedman, CEO, President, Treasurer, Director, Joshua Weaver, Vice President, Michael Allen, Security Consultant, Lexi Texera, Human Resources, Wam Wega Shaw, Community Engagement, David Kimmel, Operations, Diane Morad, Community Engagement, and Greg Henning, Community Engagement. Is the applicant present? Yes, we are. Yes, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, give us one second while we pull up the presentation. Sure. And who will be speaking first? That will be myself, Jason Sidman. I'm the CEO of Sanctuary. Okay. So Mr. Sidman, you'll have 10 minutes for your entire group to present. Yes. We'll give you a five minute warning and a two minute warning. Great. Well, okay. thank you very much. Um, are we ready to present? Yep, go ahead. Thank yep. you. Uh, thank you for having us here today. My name is Jason Sidman. I'm the CEO of Sanctuary. Um, we started our operations approximately six years ago in the state of New Hampshire. It was a merit-based application process where we received one of the highest scores and were awarded the largest geographical zone. Currently, we operate two of the five existing dispensaries. Um, coming down to the state of Massachusetts, we have a cultivation site in Littleton and currently operate a total of five licenses, three medical and two adult use. Um, we've run these operations extremely professional uh, with very close relations in every community that we operate in and have been working diligently on this location for a very long time and are very excited at the potential to actually move forward. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Greg Henning. Thank you, Jason. The proposed... Is that an alarm? Right. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you. The proposed facility at 253 Tremont Street meets all of the necessary zoning criteria. It's a standalone facility exclusively for sanctuary's use, and there'll be two levels for customers to use, including a waiting area to prevent customers gathering outside or waiting in line on the street. There are separate doors for entering and exiting to ensure a smooth flow of customers and to ensure security on the site. Pedestrians outside the building will not be able to view the interior or any of the products. Unlike the existing bar and restaurant on the site, Sanctuary will have shorter hours, the crowds will not be as large, there will be no consumption of any product on site, there will be no windows opened out to the street, and the typical customer will be spending fewer than 10 minutes in the facility. In short, the proposed location will have a much less significant impact on the community than the current operation at that location. The building is suited for public transportation access, including green line, red line, orange line, bus lines, and blue bike access. While there are nearby garages, the location is likely to generate customers primarily from foot traffic. There's also a secure loading facility on site for the delivery of products. Customers who purchase any product on site will be required to sign a community norms attestation document to ensure they're aware of and are complying with what Sanctuary expects of them when they leave the facility. Sanctuary is committed to banning anyone who does not comply with these requirements and working closely with law enforcement to ensure compliance both inside and outside the facility. Sanctuary is committed to working with the community by having security staff help to patrol surrounding areas outside the building. We will work hand-in-hand -hand with Boston Police to ensure minimal public nuisance and public impact, and this includes providing patrols by sanctuary staff to nearby areas, including a park that is located at the other end of the street. I'd now like to turn it over to David Kimmel, who will give you a rundown of the operation. 
Thank you, Greg, and good afternoon. Uh, Sanctuary's commitment to diversity and inclusion is rooted in three words, jobs, jobs, and jobs. We see workforce development as crucial in creating pathways for those in our communities who are under These pathways allow for long-term viable lifestyles that enable families to grow and thrive. Lifestyle development goes hand in hand with Sanctuary's workforce development holistic approach to assisting those who are underserved. It's not just about work, it's also about culture, art, and being a contributing member to Boston's amazing and diverse community fabric. I would now like to introduce my associate and good friend, Juan Wega, our community engagement manager, to speak to only a few of the projects and initiatives we have embraced since our recent Brookline opening. Good afternoon, wonderful people. David, thank you for your introduction and lead-in. We began our partnership with the community back in late August with the delivery and donation of a refrigeration unit to the local food pantry. At Sanctuary Brookline, we've had the pleasure of opening up a portion of our space to the Brookline Arts Center. The BAC has kicked off with a wonderful exhibit featuring arts specifically done by women of Brookline. We are currently in the planning stages of an outdoor and socially distanced family-centered Halloween bazaar to be held in the parking lot of the Brookline Teen Center on October 29th. We've been collecting donations at our registers to be distributed to nonprofits in our community. We've currently raised thousands of dollars for the Muse Foundation, a local nonprofit serving to facilitate social experiences through music creation, performance, and community for adults with disabilities. We plan on rotating our donations quarterly between various community-based organizations with steps to success set to receive our next donation. I would, like to, warning. I would like to turn it over to Chief Mike Allen, Sanctuary's Director of Security. Good afternoon, my name is Mike Allen and I am the Chief of Security for Sanctuary. I've been working in the Massachusetts cannabis industry and for Sanctuary Medicinals for the past four years. Prior to that, I was a 30 year police officer for the Rochester, New Hampshire Police Department, where I spent my last five years as the police chief prior to retiring in 2016. I've developed the security plans for all of the company's facilities in both New Hampshire and Massachusetts, as well as a comprehensive plan for this location at 253 Tremont Street. These plans have been developed in accordance with the CMR, Cannabis Control Commission regulations, local ordinances, security industry best practices, using the principles of crime prevention through environmental design, and my 30 plus years of law enforcement and security experience. Sanctuary has enacted comprehensive security procedures at all of its facilities to address the establishment, the establishment's specific security needs and allowed the company to maintain a spotless security track record. As outlined in our narrative sub submittals, Sanctuary has developed extensive policies and procedures for the use of our on-site security personnel, maintaining building and product security, delivery procedures, and preventing underage access to our products, including all measures within the CMR that will enhance the safety and security in and around the facilities. State-of-the-art security, uh, highlights of this uh, process is state-of-the-art security surveillance and alarm systems to protect against theft, unauthorized intrusion, and access control across different areas of the facility. That includes giving access to the Boston PD, to our video surveillance system in real time, comprehensive training for security personnel and sales agents to identify suspicious behavior, de-escalate contentious situations, dealing with exterior nuisance issues such as loitering or public consumption and report on safe situations to Boston PD. Stringent access control policies to prevent unauthorized sale to minors to include electronic ID verification and three separate points of ID verification, as well as strict access to customer product limits. Secure delivery procedures, which we anticipate conducting once a week in accordance with the CMR. And those are the highlights, and I'd now like to introduce Lexi, our Human Resources Director. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Lexi Texerit. I am the HR support here at Sanctuary Medicinals, and we are committed to a diverse hiring plan with at least 50% local Boston residents with special consideration to applicants that are within a mile and a half of our facility. Our initial goal is to hire 50% females and 40% minorities with a goal to increase that number annually. Our commitment to 
Our commitment to Boston and the community is to hire an ambassador who will partner with local organizations who will aid in successful opportunities for those with diverse backgrounds and improving our overall community engagement and outreach. Our recruitment team plans on hiring at max capacity 77 employees. Those ranges are from entry level to management with diverse pay ranges from 17 to $35 per hour. All roles will follow compliance such as ban the box, EEO, ADA, and mass state laws. We intend to pay 100% of public transportation to staff members. We will offer a robust insurance package, which includes paid holidays, sick time, vacation time, annual training, dental vision, et cetera. Sanctuary employees will participate in annual training, which includes conscious and unconscious bias training, sexual harassment. Now turning it over to Diane, who will talk on our community involvement. Hi, everyone. Sanctuary Medicinals has attended and presented at dozens, excuse me, dozens of meetings in the community and engaged with countless neighbors, both individuals and local merchants. We've presented dozens of letters of, uh, of support and non-opposition from residential and business neighbors. And while we understand Councillor Flynn's position, we also appreciate his acknowledgement that Sanctuary worked hard to achieve meaningful engagement with community stakeholders, including his office. The Sanctuary team will continue that robust community engagement activity on an ongoing basis. They'll invest in the local hiring of a community engagement manager to serve as the primary point of contact to the neighborhood and will actively represent Sanctuary at local civic meetings and events. Once the store is operational, Sanctuary will establish and maintain a 24-7 phone number in the event that after hours contact is needed and uh, will remain available to the community throughout. Uh, thank you, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do, thank you, um, and thank you all for your presentation. I don't know who wants to address this, but perhaps Mr. Sidman, uh, you testified that you have very close relationships, and you've been working very close, very close relationships with the community, and you've been working very close with them. Can you describe that? Because we've received a lot of opposition for this application. Or somebody. I think you're, oh, you're on mute. Yep. Thank you for that. Well, we've worked, we work with every community we're in, but over the last two years, we have done extensive outreach in the community. We've gone to dozens of meetings and done dozens of presentations. This has been a very long road. We acknowledge that I think there's some additional education that can be done certainly as we hope to move forward here uh, with what is a dispensary and what isn't. There were some concerns regarding noise. We know that factually that, that is not a, that's just not a case with the dispensary, for example. Um, we do acknowledge that we will absolutely have an outdoor person of our security team patrolling the area. Uh, that was a concern that was brought up and I think was uh, welcomed by some of our neighbors. Then we also had teams go out to meet some of the uh, surrounding and local businesses and talk to them about our plans and how we can all work together in the community, things that we've done in Brookline to date, uh, things that we've done in Gardner, and we just really try to exemplify, you know, raising the bar and doing the absolute best at all times that we can. And I personally give out my cell phone number in case there's any issues or concerns. And we acknowledge that we're gonna have a community outreach person on our team full time to handle and work with the local community. Okay, so you're testifying that what you heard is one of the community um, complaints was noise. That's right, noise Primarily. from noise from dispensaries. I think that there are other businesses that obviously in the areas such as clubs and things like that where maybe there is loud music being played, but I can assure you and everyone at this meeting that there will be no loud music. There will be no people loitering at our facility or around the facility and that it will be run extremely professional with a very uh, well-trained and well-staffed security team. Okay. I don't have any questions at this time. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yes, and it's only about this. Um, 
the noise and, and loitering. And I just realized he said that they have other establishments. So um, how did the community come up with that as a problem? Were there previous complaints about other locations that you have? Actually, there have been no complaints. So basically, I, we're, we're in close, I don't want to, we're within the proper guidelines of zoning, but we're in close proximity to a senior housing, for example. So they have mentioned that they're concerned about additional noise in the area. And although we've made assurances that that won't be the case, um, I think that there's still some apprehension about a use such of ours being in, in, in close proximity. And as I'm sure you know, and you've, you've done a tremendous amount of research on, on cannabis operators, there really isn't any noise nuisance from these facilities. In reality, in truth, we would be closed prior to a lot of these clubs even opening. We all know that right now they're not open due to the COVID restrictions, but that will likely change in the future. And we're gonna do the best we absolutely, absolutely can to work with the community and uh, run a really professional operation. But I can say that we've had, in the six years that we've been in business, we haven't had one call for service. So uh, the, the chief who's on this call can attest to that and talk about that if, if you have any further questions on that, but we've, um, we've had no issues. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Before we move on, I just want to note that we just received a request in the chat for translation services. Well, we cannot offer translation services uh, while this is uh, happening live. We will work with the uh, language access group in City Hall to have this captioned. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yeah, I do have a question and um, <clears throat> I do appreciate some of the commitments around the employment plan. One in particular that I think Lexi mentioned was the commitment to have um, employees or to, to recruit workers within a mile and a half within the facility. And, um, you know, Chairwoman uh, Joyce mentioned this, we did receive uh, quite a bit of opposition from very well-established community organizations that I think that you hope to partner for, I would assume for workers. Can you just share a little bit more about how you're gonna deal with that obstacle? Seems like a pretty big one in terms of your hiring and recruitment plan. Certainly, so what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be working with our community engagement. We're gonna be posting all the positions locally. We're also gonna be working with local agencies, um, local food businesses. We're gonna be looking, working with local shelters and we're gonna be posting all these jobs available within commuter access. Again, giving them 100% of availability for public transportation opens it up to those within closer proximity to us. We intend to hire um, or work with the Mount Wachusett Regional school that's going to be working on a cannabis reform. Um, there's just a lot of projects that we're working on and we're open to all options that we have available there. But again, all of our positions will be available for anybody of all walks of life to apply to. And we look at any recommendations that you guys have to make it a better diverse workforce. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any other questions for the applicant? No, thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions for the applicant? Thanks, Leslie. Yes, I do. One question. For, um, I think it was David. You talked about how the plan in Brookline, you know, all the things you're doing there. How does that translate? And can you be a little bit more specific about your plans for Boston and about what you're going to be doing in Boston? Because I see you're sort of located in the Chinatown neighborhood. There's, as Commissioner Lombo said, there was a lot of pushback um, in terms of that location. So can you be a little bit more specific about what you're planning to do in Boston in terms of community benefit? Certainly, and thank you for that opportunity. I uh, just want to turn my video back on. Thank you again. So as it relates to the current outreach in Brookline, which we intend to replicate in Boston, so much of it has to do with interfacing directly with community leaders and specifically to your point with people who are opposed to what sanctuary or a cannabis operation might represent in their community. So at the very beginning of that process, which should be coming up very soon, 
there will be a direct outreach to these people so that we meet face to face and they understand who we are, what our intention is, and how we collectively can collaborate so that all boats rise together. Many people tend to have an impression that cannabis businesses make a ton of money. And in some cases, there is some truth to that. But as competition comes more into the marketplace, revenues get tighter. And of course, the competition comes to bear on who gets what piece of that pie. Having said that, and understanding that the only way to really make a diversity and inclusion piece work is to go directly to those people who are in the community, who represent these entities that are underserved and collaborate. And it's a process. It does not happen overnight, particularly with those commissioner who are opposed to what we're trying to do in the community. Because initially there is concern as to what are they doing to our community? What's gonna happen to our neighborhood? And once they understand that we're first coming to listen, to understand what the concerns are so that we can work with the community to address them. So it would be a little premature, please, for me to say we're going to do A, B, and C and X, Y, and Z until we really get our arms around who in the community truly needs what and why and how we can best serve them. And that process has just begun. So we will work again closely with not only the organizations that represent certain constituencies, but the Chamber of Commerce, any of the business associations within the immediate community, any other community driven organization. So as an example, in Brookline, we felt it was very important that we work with the local merchants to ensure that we promote them. And that we, in fact, on our menu boards, in our store, when a customer comes in, one of the first things they see is support our neighborhood merchants. And we've taken all of the logos and icons from those merchants and put them on our menu board. And every 20 seconds, those merchant names pop up. And the goal is, of course, when customers come into our store to encourage them to hang out in the community, certainly not to consume publicly, but to shop at some of the stores, to spend some of their money at some of these establishments, and of course, to support the merchants immediately around our location. And that's just one example of how we intend to interface similarly in the Boston community. Thank you. Commissioner St. Guillen, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yes, I do. Uh, I also just wanted to clarify one, one thing, um, Leslie, in terms of the translation, I think there was concern about being able to testify today and have it translated. Um, and in, in if we can't, if that's not a possibility, should people submit written testimony, which will then be translated for the commissioners to see? That's an excellent question. I would encourage uh, written testimony. I think you'll also will be able to have that uh, translated more quickly. But if someone feels strongly that they would like to testify uh, verbally today, we will also work to have that translated. Okay. Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I had a, just a couple questions. So you have um, five uh, places operating in Massachusetts already, and I see you have a here a strong commitment to diversity and inclusion for the Boston area. Do you have your diversity numbers for your currently operating um, locations? Uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Are you asking, please, if we have uh, information on the current diversity and inclusion? Uh, employee status in our Brookline location? In your, so you have five locations cur yes, currently? Yes. Right, right. So in terms of overall, um, what is your demographic, uh, what is your diversity demographic of all your current employees, I would say? So the, demogra the demographic, and thank you for that question, it's, it's right in the bullseye for us, it spans a wide range of those who are underserved. 
it includes not only people of color and those who are of different ethnicity, including a wide swath of participants in our staffing, but also seniors, veterans, of course, women. And that basically rounds out our, our diversity program, but also we look to those who are physically challenged. And in some cases, we seek those who have mental handicaps whenever possible. Not so easy to achieve, but all of our operations, of course, allow for those who are disabled, and we encourage those folks to come and work with us. So again, it's a, it's a fairly wide cross-section of folks, of yeah. different backgrounds. It, it, Sure. If Thank I may, Commissioner, for... uh, collectively or around our organization, I would say I have just these are rough numbers and I can get final ones for you. About 75%, I'd say, are female, if not a little bit higher. I've got maybe 20 to 30% um, a combination of veteran and minority status, if I'm just running off the numbers I last saw. I probably have about 16 or to 12 that develop. Uh, de have themselves listed as with disabilities, but I can get those final numbers for you if you'd like. Yeah, if you could, and if you could separate them also, not um, not yeah. a combination. Uh, Absolutely. With the diversity and um, people of color and, and, and veterans separated and seniors, and I, and, I, and I do appreciate the commitment to people with disabilities, um, mm -hmm. both physical and, and mental health disabilities. Um, and intellectual disabilities. I think that's hugely, I would love, I would, if, for you to have that numbers, I would love to have that. Yep, so we can get that for you, that. absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and then lastly, I see that there, there, I don't see a metric for uh, those, uh, employing those with quarries. Is there, do you have a metric for that? Do you have, if, if you have any people currently employed in your other six mm -hmm. establishment or five establishments uh, with quarries, that would be great to see that number. And if you, have um, sort of any goals in mind for uh, employing people with quarries in your current establishment. Certainly, um, I can provide can that to you as well. Me okay, Absolutely. All right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, we will now turn to public testimony. And as a reminder, the commissioners will have an, an opportunity after the public testimony to ask any additional questions. We'll begin with public testimony of elected officials or their representatives. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Lisa High with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Our office held in the Butters meeting on March 5th, 2018. The Mayor's Office would like to go on record to oppose. Based on the community comments, we are unable to support. Thank you. Excuse me, Lisa, was that March 5th, 2019? Yeah, uh, 2018. 18. Okay. Is there Thank any you. Are there any other elected officials or representatives of elected officials who wish to testify? We will now turn to individuals who requested via email to testify, and then we will turn to individuals in the chat. Again, Hi. Sorry, Leslie, Anna from Councillor Flink's office. We would like to speak on this matter. Go ahead, Anna. We, um, provided a letter in opposition to the proposed cannabis dispensary on 2533 3 Mon Street. Um, we heard from residents and community leaders about their concerns on having cannabis dispensary at Santo the Dana. site. And I agree, and the councilor agrees that a cannabis establishment is not suitable at this location. The proposal is next to the South Cove East Plaza in Chinatown an elderly housing complex and residents at the complex have been negatively impacted by noise, trash from the nearby nightclubs, bars, and hotels. A cannabis dispensary will likely exaggerate these issues and further burn or the elderly residents at South Cove. Moreover, the site is close to the Josiah Quincy Elementary School, a daycare center, playgrounds, and the YMCA all areas where children co congregate. A recreational cannabi cannabis dispensary that is close in proximity to, especially to these areas may create an unsafe and unhealthy environment for our students and children, especially this is already an area affected by the opioid crisis 
and bad air quality. The dispensary will also likely bring more traffic into an already congested area, making it difficult for residents to travel in Chinatown and creating more pedestrian safety issues in our neighborhood. Although the applicant made an earnest effort to engage the community's residents convey that the site at 253 Tremont Street is not an appropriate location for a recreational cannabis dispensary. The constituents and the councillor are concerned that this proposed dispensary will negatively affect the quality of life of residents, including seniors and children. Neighbors have also expressed a desire for more community outreach and education as it relates to the Boston Cannabis Board and application process for recreational cannabis dispensary. Thank you so much and, have an, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. We will now turn to individuals who requested to testify. Again, as a reminder, please limit your testimony to two minutes. If you are repeating something that has been said by someone who testified previously, please state that. When called, please state your address and affiliation, if any. Calling Nancy Lowe. Hi. Um, I represent a coalition of Chinatown community organizations and institutions that have been um, gathering opposition to this application for the last uh, few years. Um, we believe that this location is not suitable for a cannabis establishment because it lies adjacent to the Chinatown community, which is one of the densest neighborhoods of the city and one of the worst asthma rates um, around. Um, there are almost 12,000 people living in one quarter, quarter square mile of this facility. There are 415 units of elderly housing, 12,087 units of low to moderate um, income housing, six daycare facilities. In fact, the Panda daycare is only 350 feet away. Um, there are two schools, six after school programs, and the Elliott Norton Park, which is 377 feet away, is heavily used by children, elderly, um, and adults. This community suffers from poor air quality due to heavy traffic coming from commuters and also from um, the location next to the Southeast Expressway and Mass Turnpike. Also, Sanctuary is a non-equity applicant and is from New Hampshire. There are no local benefits to Chinatown from this application. They tend to attract a customer base that is not from our community, and they're attracting people that are coming to either work, go to school, the theaters, the bars, or even the, or the nightclubs. They will bring an increase in traffic, crime, and now with this pandemic, more chances of infectious disease and spreading to our community. At the community meeting that was held two years ago, they had no security plan for their patients, stating that after they leave the establishment, that is not their problem. Chinatown already has a serious drug problem, and if you allow this place to open, it will only exacerbate. Drug users frequently come into our community and are often seen in our streets, sleeping in doorways, and in our parks. More importantly, this applicant is not eligible because it violates the buffer zone since it is uh, within 500 feet of a K through 12 sc existing school facility. Um, it, is, uh, it is located next, next to the Wang YMCA, which has had a 20 year uh, lease agreement with the Boston Public Schools where the Quincy upper school students have been attending physical education classes. Ma'am, that is your time. Please submit any additional comments in writing. As a reminder, the board gives equal weight to written testimony as it does to verbal testimony. Okay, thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Calling Farah Faldoni. It's 
Farah present. Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> Hello, so um, my name is Farah Faldoni. I am um, the school nurse at the Josiah Quincy School. I am here on behalf of the Josiah uh, Quincy Elementary School's Wellness Committee to express our strong opposition to the proposed cannabis establishment anticipated to be located at 253 Tremont Street in Boston. The location of such an establishment at this address is highly inappropriate and negatively um, will negatively impact the surrounding neighborhoods, health, safety, traffic, and overall quality of life. This proposed cannabis establishment is anticipated to be located in a high traffic thoroughfare and densely populated area that is a short distance to Josiah Quincy Elementary School. According to the uh, Mass Department of Public Health, our school has the second highest pediatric asthma rate of all Boston public schools at 35.5 asthma rates. The state's average rate is 12.4. The additional uh, traffic this proposed establishment will bring will increase the pollutants in our, uh, our area. A cannabis establishment anticipated located would only exacerbate the existing drug uh, related issues in the nearby parks and school zones. The Josiah Quincy School continues to partner with the City Grounds Department and the SHARP team to um, issue the drug use loitering in our school grounds at all hours and finding drugs paraphernalia, including use of hypodermic needles in our, in our outdoor playgrounds um, for schools, for students. What's, uh, what's, what's, to, uh, what's important to note, in this anticipated location at 253 Tremont Street is within the 500 feet of the YMCA facility. Under the Article 2A, the, y wing, uh, the wing YMCA. Ma'am, that is your time. Again, any additional comments can be submitted via email. To clarify one thing for the record, the arrangement between the YMCA and the academic institution does not qualify under the law as a buffer zone conflict. That being said, that does not mean that the proximity to the YMCA, which students congregate, at which students congregate, or any of the other establishments that, that have been testified to or that will be testified to can be considered by the board. The board will absolutely consider that proximity. However, for the record, this does not qualify under the law as a buffer zone conflict. As a reminder, please limit your testimony to two minutes. Calling Susan Chu. Is Susan present? Good afternoon, my name is Susan Chu and I'm speaking on behalf of the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association in opposition to uh, Sanctuary Medicinals application for a shop, uh, pot shop at Tremont Street. Um, I'm not gonna repeat uh, a lot of the testimony that was already offered, so I just have a couple of items to add. I'd like to reiterate testimony that's already been given, but um, two notes. I've attended the public meetings that were held by Sanctuary both back in March, and recently I also met with them, I would say maybe a month or two ago with a smaller group through Zoom, and their plans for their operations have been extremely vague and non-responsive to a lot of the concerns raised by the community. When addressed with safety concerns and with concerns about, you know, their product being illegally um, put into the hands of minors, they sort of sidestep the issue, much like they sidestep uh, Commissioner St. Keen's question earlier today by saying, well, you know, the site itself is going to be really secure. But the gist of that comment really is that, you know, once, once the product leaves our stores, whatever adverse impacts there are in the community are the community's problems. I also want to point out, um, since they say they have a commitment to diversity, I want to read to the commission a review from a former employee that's posted on Glassdoor. The title says, it's hard to imagine working or staying here if you're a minority or person of color. Management should be mandated to undergo bias training and purposely hire folks to people who are not similar to themselves. In the long run, I think the problems that this facility is going to bring to the neighborhood are going to far outweigh whatever money they are, they are going to uh, pay in terms of the community benefit because the area is already plagued by a lot of sort of social issues with homelessness, drug use, 
and this is only going to add to the problem. We already have a problem in the, in the neighborhood with, uh, you know, issues with nightclubs, drunken patients coming out, fighting and whatnot. And Ms. Chu, that is your time. Again, please submit any additional testimony in writing. Calling Peggy Ings. I just want to remind people who are privately uh, messaging me in the chat, um, we'll get to you as far as testimony. I, um, I'm not able to monitor it and listen at the same time. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Peggy Ings and I'm the Vice President of Government and Community Relations at Emerson College. And the college is also a member of the Midtown Park Plaza Neighborhood Association, which I've, which I've been asked to represent today as well. Um, I wanna first say that the folks from Sanctuary did meet with the Midtown Neighborhood Association. Several concerns came up. And during this last few months, we have asked repeatedly for them to come back to this organization, which is one of the largest uh, in-town organizations that represents many, many stakeholders in the area. It's one of the longest running community organizations as well. We asked them why they couldn't come. There was no answer. This morning, before the Midtown Neighborhood Association's monthly meeting, I received a letter from the security individual outlining answers to those questions and to those concerns. It was too late to even disseminate it to our group, but I just wanted to say they've had ample opportunity to come back and meet with people. They have not kept that commitment. Today was the first time they responded to the organization. So I think you need to examine their true commitment to this community. The community two years ago came out with hundreds of people at the Revere Hotel. I think it begs the question to this group particularly, what are the specifics? There are no specifics to anything they have answered. So I don't wanna be repetitious, but other people have just stated the same. Security issues are huge. Um, also, there is a college there as you know, Emerson abuts that from the south side of the state's transportation building. And I will say that we are very concerned about it because I don't know what security they have for students. I don't know what their plans are for IDing students. We don't know a thing. And that's because they never return to the Midtown Neighborhood Association. Therefore, I respectfully request at the very minimum that you defer your decision to um, their application until they do commit to coming back to all these organizations that have asked for further community outreach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Calling Debbie Ho. Is Debbie Ho present? We will now turn to individuals who requested to testify in the chat. Who has testified? Uh, there is a Jason who has requested to testify. Jason, please state your full name, address, and your affiliation, if any. Um, hi, my name is Jason Cho. No affiliation at 42 Chauncey Street in Boston. And uh, I'll keep it real short under 30 seconds. And just want to say that uh, my kid goes to one of the daycares in the area. There's six daycares within three block radius and then two schools that my child will eventually go to that's within a one block radius. So I want you to consider that, that would you want something like this next to a child's school or daycare to be exposed to such a thing? I'm pragmatic, I don't oppose to marijuana, but ju it's just the location itself. And people tend to overpromise and under deliver. And I can tell you that more often than not, I'm the one as a community member, I'm the one who has to flag issues, reach out to our city folks, tell them to correct it. 
So you know, I, I am tired of having to flag issues all the time for people who under deliver on their promises. Thank you. Thank you. Bailian Huang had a comment in the chat. I just want to clarify if you were talking. Oh, really? Now they can hear Is Bailian Huang present? Yeah, you can talk. Paul Roach has requested to testify. Is Paul Roach present? Hi, I'm here. Good Hi. afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Paul Roach and I'm the Director of Residences at the W Boston Hotel and Residences. I'm here today representing two different entities, both the W Boston Hotel and the Condo Association that's located above the hotel. The hotel, um, the hotel opposes this application, um, as does the residences. But I want to use my time to speak specifically for the HOA. There are 122 taxpaying uh, owners that live directly to this next to this site. In fact, we might be the closest neighbor to this location, sharing an alley that I believe they'll be using for their load-in, load-outs. Speaking to various residents, they uh, vehemently oppose this application. They're, it's a very dense neighborhood. They're concerned about the traffic, both vehicle and transient, people walking in to this area that is already a very um, traffic when, when COVID's not around location. So we uh, oppose this application. Thank you very much. Nick, do you have a clerk? No, it's on the record. Do you have Clark present? I'm present. Um, I would like to pass our school nurse from Josiah Quincy spoke already on the issues and members of South Pole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Hi. Hi, ma'am. Would you like to testify? Hello. Um, my name is Ruth Moy, and I'm executive director of the Greater Boston Chinese Golden Age Center. And um, I uh, want you to know that in this neighborhood, there are hundreds and hundreds of seniors and so many housing uh, facilities. And uh, my agency, uh, provides many services to them. I work closely with the city of Boston and the state to provide the programs and, and uh, services to help them age well in the community. Um, I, on their behalf, I really think that this uh, uh, program uh, is not appropriate for this community. And uh, it is so dense and so many elderly and children around it. And I, I really think it's not uh, not a good thing for us because we've worked so hard to upgrade our community, keep it safe uh, for everyone. And uh, you know, I'm also a co-moderator of uh, the Chinatown Neighborhood Council and we have a safety committee and we work so hard with the city of Boston so, uh, and the police department to uh, keep the community, uh, make it better uh, because years ago it really wasn't so great. And uh, I remember that uh, Santoro did come before the Neighborhood Council um, a couple of years ago, I guess. And uh, there was some discussion. And one of the things they said was uh, that there was a waiting room inside. And I remember, so how big is this waiting room? How, how many people will it hold? You know how people uh, wait in line outside and queuing around the block. And uh, they said, was there the whole 200? Of course not. 100? No. 50? No. It will hunt 20 people. So there will be queuing around. And so um, I would really urge you not to uh, consider this uh, location. Thank you very much. Calling Richard Chang. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. 
Um, my name is Richard Chang. I'm the head of school of the Josiah Quincy Upper School, sister school of uh, the elementary school. Uh, I also uh, sit on the advisory board of the Wang YMCA as its chair. Um, I, uh, we are a school that's for grades six through 12, and we have 550 students. Uh, our physical education program is uh, administered through the Wang YMCA. Uh, it is effectively our third campus uh, because of our space sh shortage. So uh, while technically the Wang YMCA may not be uh, considered uh, relevant, but in fact, it is in fact our physical education facility. Uh, we currently have various substance cessation programs for nicotine and alcohol. If this uh, application is, or this waiver is granted, that we'll probably have to add marijuana to that. Um, it's pr pretty well known that young people can access these substances through proxies or show buyers. Um, I'm sorry to say from my own experience, I, I can get any adult nearby to buy any alcohol. You know, when I was in high school, it was not a problem to access substances. And given that uh, marijuana will become, is legal in this, it's not that difficult to get show buyers uh, uh, to purchase on behalf of young people. So there's no question that this is gonna get into the hands of my students, no question about that. Um, I think this also uh, conjures up some um, symbolism, which is very stark, particularly in our current climate. Um, in the bad old 60s, the uh, Scolay Square uh, red light district was uh, re, uh, redesignated to Chinatown to make way for the current city hall. And that was an instance where clearly, culturally, there was no benefit for Chinatown, and it was imposed on our community um, uh, without, we, ha we were powerless. Mr. Chang, powerless. that is your but, time. Again, please feel free to submit. Uh, I will, thank you. Thank you. There is a comment in the chat from Breslin. Is there a Breslin who wishes to testify? No, I'm sorry. Uh, this Zoom feature is used by my daughter as well. My name is Steve, uh, so I indicated my name in the chat. I'm her father. Uh, I do have three children uh, that attend uh, the Josiah Quincy schools. Um, my wife is a uh, local high school teacher in the BPS system, and I'm a resident of the area. Um, I, I'm not asking or, or sharing any thoughts or uh, opinions here. I'm asking for those who are in support or in support of opposition to fa share some evidence or factual information to why they support opposition to it. Um, what I'm, in general, what I'm hearing is a tremendous amount of opinions that it's too noisy, that there's secondhand smoke, that it's gonna create traffic. So. It would be, uh, you know, as a parent, resident, um, and uh, family of educators, it would be great to hear a supported argument from both sides. Steve, what was your last name? My last name is Voigt. Thank Mr. you very much. Mr. Chang is, and I are familiar with each other. Thank you very much. Uh, Bayo Leon Kuang has requested to testify. Looking to see if you are present. Yes. Hello. Hi. Please go ahead. Oh, any I'm sorry, we can't hear you. You cannot hear? Can, can you hear? We can hear you, but not the oh. person in the background. Okay, because the, the lesson who living in South Korea is there on the phone. You can see the, the name is uh, her, Shu Her, the last one, uh, Shu Her, S U H E, because uh, she cannot uh, do the lesson, don't know how to turn on the 
the, the microphone. And then just call my cell phone. And I'm calling from a pandemic professor. Oh, Suhi. So Suhi and Jing Jing Wu. Yeah. Okay. Yes, they have you? Yeah, because they don't know how to train the elderly who live in the South Coast East. Yes, just, we have that. Uh, uh, yeah, they just want to let all of you know the letter, say the whole building lesson uh, uh, again, this project, just let you know. If, if you want, uh, let me see. Sorry. I think we do have that letter. You could let okay. Suhi and- But they really want to speed out. That's why they asked, call me to, to, to let okay. you know. Okay. 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 Oh, they say they have found a group lesson in the in uh, Miss Wu house. They all the lesson. Oh, they were just say again this this path. Okay, just to let you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi, Okay. Thank you. We have a Shirok Reza. Shirok. present. Is there anyone who has not testified who wishes to testify? And please keep in mind that the record will remain open until on Wednesday. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Seeing no one, uh, Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? I do. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to pick up the pick up on to testify. Sorry, someone in oh. the chat wants to testify. Perpetual. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I have been in these meetings throughout, um, and the the whoever the the person prior that has spoke um two people go brought up a good point in terms of you know lots of opinions and things of and concerns and things of that nature but you know what are the facts and the fact of the matter is when i look when i when i look at this particular proposal and especially being a resident of dorchester and a long time resident of boston and things of that nature i i see nothing but opportunities for communities of color specifically Black um, black families and black community members in Boston to to see that there there is hope, especially in this three tiered pandemic that we're in, which we know is largely hitting communities of color, specifically Boston. I see this 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 business bringing nothing but hope and you know equity to economic equity to our communities. And so when I hear things about traffic and things of that nature, that is that is nothing in comparison to the lives and generations of black lives that are we can hope will be building future sustainable businesses, such as the businesses that are being the business that's being presented here. Thank you. There is a uh, Rebecca Lee has requested to testify. Is Rebecca Lee present? Yes, I'm present. Um, I'm I live at One Nassau Street in Chinatown. I'm a 16 year resident of Chinatown. Um, to the not immediate speaker, but the speaker before that, um, the the onus is on the proponent to show that this is an appropriate location for this use. I think it's pretty clear that it is not an appropriate location for this use. I'm loath to understand how they can partner with neighborhood organizations when all of the neighborhood organizations have spoken out and testified and written in opposition to this, including next door neighbors like the W and its residents, the school, the Y, et cetera. So I don't understand how a neighborhood partnership is going to be um, formed and I also think it's frankly laughable that the proponent would suggest that this use at that location is better than having a restaurant that currently serves the theater district and the city as a whole. This is a terrible location, and I hope that the board will look at the facts of this and, and listen to the neighborhood and turn this down. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Patricia Barnwell has requested to testify. Hello. Um, I just wanted to check in. I put my comments in the chat. So I'm Patricia Barnwell, the Senior Executive Director at the Wang YMCA, which um, it's been mentioned a couple of different times that we have a longstanding uh, contract with the City of Boston to provide uh, phys ed services on our site which I believe is within the uh, buffer zone, which the 500 feet, um, I guess that issue has come up and we've gone out there and done the measurements. We also operate an early education center, which a daycare center on site for 75 children. And right now we have a community learning pod, which is happening all day long, um, supporting kids, elementary school children that would be um, physically across the street if the school was fully operating and had on-site. So we have on-site to support children and their families here. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Arturo Gossage has requested through Lynn to testify. Is Arturo present? Arturo's on the phone. His phone number ends with 0842. Can you unmute him, please? Give me one moment. I am trying to unmute him, but it he has it set so that I cannot unmute him. So we would encourage Arturo, unless you can unmute yourself, please submit. Hi. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me uh, time to talk today. Uh, so I, I heard, I, I dialed in late. I'm sorry for dialing in late. And I heard a question about uh, people asking for proof that this will have an impact on our, on our neighborhood and our community. And I can tell you, this has been not this particular topic, but many topics have been well established as having an impact on childhood development. All right, there, there's a test called the ACEs test that's popular in psychology and in medical journals. And the ACEs is an acronym for Adverse Childhood Experiences, okay? One of the leading doctors who researches this is named Nadine Burke Harris. She's a black woman. She went to Harvard. She lives in San Francisco as a doctor. She helped save a community whose culture was crumbling under the weight of all these ACEs. ACEs are things like childhood sexual abuse, childhood physical abuse, uh, childhood neglect, and there certainly is a lot of drug abuse in the homes of these individuals who go on later in life to have trouble with developing personal relationships, they have trouble with PTSD, and it's a lot of impact that people aren't taking into account. So this is strong evidence that I think people need to really look at. And I'll tell you her name, again, is Nadine Burke Harris, and the test they have is called ACEs, and once again, it's advanced childhood, um, adverse childhood experiences. So this this is real. It's been documented. Thank you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shuruk Reza has again requested to testify. Shuruk. Tracy Situ has requested to testify. Tracy? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mida. I'll probably just uh, say something. Um, I, the, as the resident of the, the, the Chinatown area resident, I want to, I, I want to uh, say no to, how to say, opposed to the, this um, proposal. Like in that uh, area, you guys want to put that. Um, that that's not the uh, right position to to have that store open, for my own opinion. Because this school around there and the, the uh, elderly apartments around there, so we uh, they have a lot of park around there. So the kids go to that that park to play a lot. So I don't think that's the right position for that. I know those um it's good for some. For medical use, 
uh, for people, it's good for somebody, but um, I think that's not the right position to put that store there in, that, uh, in our community. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is there anyone who has not previously testified who wishes to testify? Chairwoman Joyce, you would indicate additional questions for the applicant. Thank you. I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is that these opinions are important. Um, people are, we want to hear residents um, in this neighborhood's opinions, which brings me to um, the question I have. This, this really is a neighborhood. Um, a couple of the people who testified today, specifically Susan Chu and Richard Chang, talked about um, the fact that this is a neighborhood. And um, this neighborhood has once been under, um, in, in previous years, known as an adult entertainment district, a red light district, whatever it is. And I believe that this neighborhood has worked really hard to change that reputation. And we do want to hear what the neighbors' opinions are. And to that point, my question is, what exactly is the diversion to minors plan? You could elaborate on that. Especially in light of the fact that my concern is this, this is a, a well-known uh, traffic area. It's very congested. It's densely populated. You, the applicant mentioned that this, there'll be a 10 minute shopping um, time frame. So what I envision in this neighborhood is that people live parking while someone jumps out and goes inside and spends 10 minutes shopping, causing further congestion in the neighborhood. Um, what is the plan for that? And what is the plan for um, diversion to minors? Or comment on that from the applicant. So this is Greg Henning as part of the applicant's team. With regard to the first question that you asked about the parking, um, there's not designated parking spots out front and that's gonna be intentional. And we are in communication and can be in continuous with communication with Uber and Lyft to make sure it does not become a drop-off spot. You can actually work with them so that if somebody puts in Uber and Lyft for that address and that location, it can drop them off at a place that's not right in front of it. In terms of the diversion plan, when a person comes into the location, they need to show identification and they need to have that ID scanned. And that's part of the security procedures that the chief talked about. In addition to that, when a person goes in and purchases, they are signing and acknowledging that they can't use any product near the facility. And there's also existing regulations that require people to not obviously use it out in the street. There's gonna be security personnel that are outside of the facility helping to patrol the area to ensure that that isn't happening. And in addition, we're working with and are uh, committed to working with Boston police to expand that perimeter of where the security would be working so that they're not just at the door of the facility, but they're in the surrounding areas. In terms of the diversion uh, procedures, patrol who can be trained by Boston police can ensure that, I think it was Mr. Chang who mentioned it, if somebody is a straw buyer, for example, that they can't go around the corner and hand it off to somebody. That's part of why there's gonna be continuous surveillance and cameras in the area. And we're certainly willing to work with any of the community groups that want us to provide any sort of training, assistance, or information to local facilities, whether it's community groups or the schools about diversion and the process of doing that. But there are steps in place to ensure that underage people aren't purchasing. There are steps in place to ensure security is patrolling around the area to make sure that there's no handoff. And we're absolutely willing to work with the community to create and be part of any programming to that end. So Mr. Henning, just to follow up on that, someone did testify that at one of the community meetings, someone said it's when they leave the premise, it's not their problem. So are you testifying now that you've reconsidered that and you've put these additional measures in place? I certainly was not at a community meeting where that was ever said. I've been working in the community meetings, I believe, since March of 2019. And not only have we uh, acknowledged that it's a responsibility as a community partner to be working outside of the facility, but we've said that at every event that I've ever been a part of. And so, yes, it's absolutely part of the responsibility to be a good community partner and a good neighbor. And it's bad for everybody if there is a collateral impact on people like that. So to the extent that that's uh, readdressing the comment, absolutely, Sanctuary acknowledges that they need to do that as part of being a good neighbor and a good um, business in the community. Okay, thank you. Chair, Chairwoman, if I could just add a couple of points to uh, Mr. If you, if you can keep it to about 30 seconds, because it's already going on over an hour and 15 minutes, so go ahead. We'll do that. Just, just a, a few other uh, points to make regarding anti-diversion. 
Uh, we do have a seed to sale tracking system that, that's employed uh, in every dispensary throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, that, that tracks the product from, from when it's first planted to when it goes out the door in a dispensary. So being able to track uh, products as when they leave the facility, if they were an underage purchase or, or a, 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 Okay, a, I'm gonna a, thank you for, I'm gonna thank you. If you wanna submit anything else in writing, I'd appreciate it. And again, sh before we return to the commissioner's questions, Sharok Reza has again requested to testify. Uh, Mr. Reza, if you cannot unmute yourself this time, we will have to accept written testimony. Are you present? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. How is everybody? Please keep in mind you have a two minute limit. Thank you so much for taking my te testimony. I'm one of the principals of 253 Tremont Street. And I just wanted to really quickly go about the location. I think the area is in the heart of downtown, is right in the open. And the amount of security that these folks would apply, I think it's very easy to go to their Coolidge Corner location in Brookline and see what a wonderful operation they run. You're within anywhere close to the area, you get greeted and you're seen by cameras as well as uh, security personnel. You know, as far as the underage, I don't think their issue would be there because they literally run you through every uh, database that they can to make sure you are who you are before they let you in. And I think the neighborhood, would, you know, folks, everybody I heard talk about this as some, this has a medicinal effect that people need. And it's something that it's, it's in my belief, is much safer than a, a liquor store, uh, you know, being opened up. So I wish everybody would give this a chance and see how well these guys run this operation, has medicinal effects and patients that would have access to this. The downtown area is dead and we need to do whatever we can. And I can, on our behalf, assure you guys that these guys run it. And, and it's again, easy to see in their Brookline location. Uh, just go and see what- Mr. Reza, are you, Mr. Reza, just to clarify, are you the landlord of this location? I am one of the partners, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And I only speak on my behalf. I apologize. I want to make that clear because I have not had a chance to consult with my partners. But I thought it was important for me to, to mention who these guys are, what their track record is, and what they've done, and how they've done it. Um, I think location-wise, it's actually good that it's, you know, we've, Boston Police has cameras that we invested in with them through the area. So every inch of that area is covered with cameras. I'm going to have to wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. And let's make sure we have the, the, in the interest of everyone else who's joined us today, we wanna to make sure we keep the comments to two minutes. Returning to the commissioners, Commissioner Holmes, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? No, not at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? No, not at this time, thank you. Commissioner Smith, do you have any additional questions? No, thank you. And Commissioner St. Guillen, do you have any additional questions? The board will take this matter under advisement and vote on it this coming Wednesday. As a reminder, the record will remain open for written public comment until Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Thank you all. Returning to second call for item one. Item one has already been read into the record. The applicant is the Grazen Group. Is the applicant prepared? Yes, the applicant is prepared. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just so you know, Cheryl Crawford will be giving the presentation. Uh, our security consultant, uh, Edward Dominguez, uh, called in on the telephone number 293-1080. So if that could be um, unmuted, that would be appreciated. I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl Crawford. Uh, and my name is Mike Ross. I'm the attorney for the, for the board. Cheryl? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> Go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I am Cheryl Clyburn Crawford here to present a proposal on adult use cannabis establishment at 533 Washington Street in Codman Square. Next slide. Our... Um, I'm sorry. Grazing Group LLC is owned 51% by me, a certified Boston Economic Empowerment Applicant, and my partner, Steve Suda. I grew up in Codman Square. My first three jobs were actually located in Codman Square. I used to work at a laundromat that used to be 
milk into the next door to the Lawson's Barbershop. Across the street, I worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And further down the block, I used to work at Brigham's Ice Cream Store, which is no longer there. Um, my sister was a swim instructor at the Lee School for over 20 years, and I still have many family and friends in this same neighborhood but also in my professional life as the executive director of MASPO and the first vice president of the NAACP, I've extended a lot of time and many resources to increase civic participation. I feel extremely fortunate to have been introduced to Steve a little over three years ago with him already owning a property that was properly zoned. And our relationship has blossomed because of our the mission we both want to accomplish. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, our leadership team consists of myself, um, majority owner, and Steve Scooter, and our community liaison, Derek Small. Next slide, please. Our retail facility, it's a proposed retail recreational cannabis dispensary. It's properly zoned already as a neighborhood shopping. Uh, it's a commercial building already. It was owned by Stephen. And so we have a 20 year lease in place with Stephen's company. And as such, the partnership is full control of the building and we get to control the longevity of Grayson. Stephen owned the previous business that was located there. Um, which was a daycare facility for, over, for a little over two years, um, in which 90% of all of the staff lived within a mile were women and individuals of color. Our proposed operate, hours of operation are from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Next slide, please. And this is um, just, not just, but it's a, a, it shows our, um, that there are many, um, modes of public transportation to have, that have access to two bus lines, a commuter rail, and the red line. Next slide, please. Um, for this, I, you know, I just want to say that we are proper, the building is already properly zoned as a neighborhood shopping zoning district. Next slide. This is our site plan an overview from the street indicating the five parking spaces on the site for customers that need it. Next slide. <clears throat> this is floor plan one. This is the right size facility for where it is located. We have ample room for queuing and waiting, 250 square feet waiting area. Um, customers enter and exit through separate doors. Um, the average transaction time is five to 10 minutes. All retail sales will be conducted on the first floor and we will be encouraging online ordering. As you can see at the top left of the screen, you can, our dedicated phone order pickup area to alleviate any consumer congestion inside or outside. Next slide, please. Which is the basement floor plan. The basement will house employee only areas and is limit, and has limited access areas for product storage and security equipment. Separate entrance for deliveries on Rosedale Street so that there is a separation from the consumers and from the deliveries. Next slide, please. My favorite slide, diversity and inclusion. It talks about our hiring goals of hiring 50% women, 90% people of color, um, local job, we'll be advertising at local job fairs and advertising as well as word of mouth. Um, we will be advertising with mass, um, mass hire. Next slide, please. Um, the beautiful, I just want to say the beautiful thing about our diversity and inclusion plan is that Stephen in his previous business already exceeded those proposed numbers um, with hiring 90% from the, over 95% from the community and people of color and women. And we will ensure that um, these numbers are exceeded again. Our employment. Thank you. Employment plan. We have a plan for employees of the Boston residents comprised of 51% Dorchester residents, goal of hiring 50% residents and 80% Boston residents. We have a plan for people hiring people of color. We have a plan for offering competitive wages and benefits adhering to the Boston Living Wages Ordinance. Um, we have plans for employment, employing individuals with criminal records, we'll be advertising with mass hire, um, operation, operations exit programs, and the mayor's office of returning citizens. 
Next slide, please. Location, uh, safety, extensive security policy has been provided by Crow. Every domain is available to answer questions. We went above and beyond and hired the best and one of the most reputable companies in Crow because we knew based on our multiple meetings with the community and multiple neighborhood associations that security and safety were one of the most important, if not the most important, topic regarding cannabis proposals. So we want to make sure that the neighborhood knew that we were taking them serious. Now we will have one or two security personnel on site. We will also be requiring our customers to execute a good neighbor policy stating that they will comply with certain qualities. Next slide. Um, I'll just say here in the effort to ensure that we were going to be able to hit the ground running. If approved, we took an additional step of having a traffic analysis by Hayes Engineering to inform ourselves of peak hours, traffic impact, and associated mitigation suggestions and protocols. This plan has been submitted to the board. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I'm wrapping up here. It's with our community feedback. We've got letters of no oppos non-opposition from the District City Councilor Andrea Campbell, as well as from the Talbot Norfolk Neighborhood United Association. We met with many of the associations several times to just really unpack the plan for them. We received over 160 letters of support of support from business owners and neighbors in that community and also talk to them about implementing a civic board that would allow us to um, have them have input in what it is that we will be doing in the neighborhood. So with that being said, I think I'm at my five minutes, 10 minutes. You still have two more minutes, but. <laughs> How I flew through, but I just want to stress with these two minutes how important and critical I have been a member of this community personally, with my family, with my work ethic, with my business. I truly believe in the economic empowerment of this, of this opportunity. I truly believe that, um, that we can make a difference in that community by providing resources to that community um, as well. You know, we plan to go above and beyond what is required by the city to, to be in a neighborhood. I, you know, the, I forget the tax rates exactly offhand, but we already plan to add additional funds into that community to help revitalize it and to sustain it and to support it. Um, Cheryl, you might want to add the uh, additional letters of support that you, you uh, sent in just, just uh, last night and this morning, uh, I believe the city council president and others. That's right. I did get a letter of support uh, from the city council president and from at-large city councilor Julia Mejia, from many concerned neighbors of um, organization leaders, people that can attest to my, to me, my work ethic, the things that I've done in the community, um, my love for my community, and how I really want to hope is in, in support this community. But, and I have more that are good. They get, didn't get in on time, but we'll be there before Wednesday at 10 a.m. I did hear you say you're accepting testimony until that time. So we do have t tons more of letters. I'm sorry, we have an election going on and that is my day job. But anyway, um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do. I have one question on the parking. I think um, the board memo states that there's, I think, five parking spots. Yes. yes. Where are those located? If you look on the first slide, the site plan, you can see the five on the right hand side, there's five parking spaces. Okay. And do you propose those will be for customers or your employees? Um, we, for customers. We're going to encourage, we're going to be hiring from within the community. That is our plan. Um, and with all the different modes of transportation, and we're going to incentivize our employees to be on public transportation or being or just living in the neighborhood. Thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, yes. Um, not so much a question, but a comment. It's just something that um, I just wanted to know why many of the um, security um, officers for the many applications that we've reviewed, um, none of them were armed. And I'm just a little concerned that in their security plan that they, first of all, plan, it says one armed security person. 
And, and I'm just a little nervous about an armed security person. That says that in our plan? Yeah, yeah. Commissioner, I, I think you're, you're spot on. And I think that that was something we overlooked. Um, this plan was submitted uh, long, long enough ago that um, it was still considered somewhat um, maybe accepted. I, I, I think the, the, the common practice now is unarmed all the time. So we'll make that amendment um, and we apologize for it getting through. Obviously the, the combination of the cannabis and having any kind of arms nearby cannabis is not a good formula. Um, and uh, th that, that slipped by us, we apologize because I don't think that's something that the client wanted. Um, and I think it had to do with being an earlier, an earlier uh, application. Okay, and, and one more caveat to that. I would strongly suggest that it be more than one because because of the location of the area, you're gonna have to have somebody outside monitoring the side street and the front and a person can't do both. You can't have somebody inside monitoring your you know, your facility inside, as well as ensuring that we don't have people passing stuff off or smoking when they come outside. So, I mean, you, you're definitely gonna need more than one person. And we also, I didn't mention it in that, it's in the proposal that we do plan to have cameras inside and outside, especially going down that side street. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any questions? No. Commissioner Holmes covered it because exactly the thing I <laughs> I saw was the armed security. Um, everything else, uh, the applicant Cheryl, I think um, really high goals. Um, I would like to to just know um, just one question: What as an equity applicant, you know, this board really wants to support equity applicants, and you have such high goals around people of color. Um, have there been any specific things that you think might be uh, good support systems um, for you to be able to get to reach those goals. If you, if you don't have to answer that question now, um, if that's something that you want to provide in supplemental, I think that's something the board will want to know. I, I would love to flush that out and, and just talk about the networks that we have and how we plan to, to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions for the applicant? Sure. Hi, Cheryl. Um, given your you talked about detailing how you're going to support and sustain the surrounding community. Can you just be a little bit more specific on that? Supporting and sustaining that. that we talked about when we had um, our community meetings was um, um, an extra carry. And I forget uh, the amount of money that we said we will put aside out of our business. And that's why we would create a board that would help us make the determination of where that money was gonna go. Like it wouldn't go to the same entity or agency or organization every year. It would be somebody that we would, and it would be this board that would help us determine what did they need, who, who should. So businesses in and around that area? Correct. Like the court. Okay. May, I, may, I, may I add as well? Yes. I, I think one of the things uh, our main focus was understanding that when taxes are produced from this business and with the uh, host community agreement at 3%, um, trying to follow that money to where it actually goes to to see where it goes into the neighborhood specifically is very difficult. So what we want to do is to take a percentage um, as well and with the relationship that we have with the local uh, associations and the local neighborhood groups, really put something together where um, certain businesses or whatever it may be put in RFPs or requests for proposals for development in the neighborhood where we could allocate that money as a civic board to ensure that this capital is specifically and solely for this neighborhood opposed to waiting for a government to try and issue that 3%. So that's, that's something that we've been very passionate about and, and we look forward to doing. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sankey, and do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, no, I don't actually. That's one of the <laughs> uh, aspects of being last, I think, is your questions oftentimes get asked, but uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to hear more about the proposal. Thank you, and I apologize. I inadvertently I skipped over Attorney Chayla White and her equity certification. Attorney White? Thank you, no worries. Uh, so I was able to uh, certify this application as an equity applicant. Um, Ms. 
Clyburn Crawford met at least four of the criteria set forth in the ordinance establishing equitable re regulation of the cannabis in industry in Boston. Sorry, I can't speak, I'm tongue-tied tongue today. Uh, <laughs> so the first uh, criteria that she met is uh, being a person who has resided in an area of disproportionate impact for at least five of the past 10 years. Um, Ms. Clyborn Crawford uh, provided documentation that she's been a Boston resident for at least uh, the last 10 years and that she has lived in two areas, uh, two census tracts that have been designated areas of disproportionate impact by the CCC. Uh, she is also given the documentation that she provided a person who has resided in the city of Boston for the past seven years. Um, uh, Ms. Clyburn Crawford self-identifies as African American, uh, and um, she's also uh, certified by the CCC as an economic empowerment applicant and has lived in Boston for, again, <laughs> at least the past 10 years. Um, and if there are any questions about the documentation that she provided, I'm more than happy to answer those questions. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Joyce or any of the commissioners, do you have questions regarding the equity certification? I don't. Seeing none, we will begin with public testimony, beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Is there anyone present who wishes to testify? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Chantal Lima Barboza with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Keith Williams from our office held the community process on Monday, November 25th, 2019. Um, and the community was pretty much 50-50 in regards to support or in opposition. We also know that there is a local civic organization that is not in support of this proposal and the district councilor of this uh, area is also on non-opposition. At this time, the mayor's office would like to defer it to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives who wish to testify? Seeing no one, we will begin with individuals who reached out requesting to testify. Again, your time will be limited to two minutes. If you are making remarks that are duplicative of someone who has testified before you, please be respectful of everyone's time and state that. You can also submit written testimony. When I call your name, please state your address and affiliation, if any. Calling Diane Wilkerson. Good afternoon uh, to Madam Chairman and the Executive Secretary. My name is Diane Wilkerson. No affiliation. Um, I'm at 22 Burrell Street in Roxbury, Massachusetts, have been a Boston resident now for 42 years. Um, I did submit a letter of support already, and so I won't uh, repeat it. All I'll just say is that um, having spent a, a fair number of uh, professional career uh, advocating around issues of equity and justice and mass incarceration and all of that and being well aware of the impact um, that the um, uh, focus on um, crime and drug-related marijuana, you name it, has had on this community. Um, we are at a time now where we have an opportunity to do some um, reparation for the damage and the sacrifice. I could not think of a better person in terms of the character, um, a, a better, a better uh, team, um, and I wholeheartedly support it. And that's really all I want to say is that it's time to see some of our folks on the other side of this equation. Um, Cheryl Clyburn Crawford has been an enormous and tremendous um, uh, citizen of this community uh, at every level and at every stop. And so I would uh, support her without reservation, without hesitation. And I support uh, the project and hope that this uh, body will give approval to their request for the dispensary in Common Square. Thank you. I want to be respectful of time. Thank you very much. Calling, calling Luis Eliza. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, thank you, Commissioner, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Luis Eliza. I live at 68 Seaver Street in uh, Dorchester. And I'm a member of the community and have been an active member for uh, almost 50 years that I've been in Boston. I've served in law enforcement, I've served in public safety, and I've served in public health, working in the area of drugs and other areas of challenge for the communities of color. And I can tell you that I'm here today to give full-hearted support 
to the great group and to Cheryl Crawford because I know their character and I know what they tend to represent. And you don't want to get into the hysteria of why we're having some of these discussions because I know that for the majority of people who testify against having marijuana in their neighborhood, they've said little or nothing about CVS or um, Walgreens or any of the other drug stores that dispense a lot more uh, drugs in the community and have challenges to the community. But I think it is important to understand that to have a business that will represent the change in entrepreneurship for a substance that in 1930, up until 1937 was accepted part of medicinal society, um, this is the best group. Um, one, because the character of Ms. Crawford and the character of the other people involved and her commitment to make sure that the community is always treated with respect and with safety and that her eye and her vision, the lens from which she views the work that she's doing is to be a benefit and not to be a detriment to the folks who in a sense will participate and the folks who are around there. And so given her past history, working in the community, working with people, particularly people with challenges, economic and social challenges, I think that this would be a very good decision to support their efforts for entrepreneurship and endurance in that community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Calling Lulu Butter. Is Lulu Butter present? Calling Andrew Litchfield. Is Andrew Litchfield present? Calling Jennifer Petsy. Brandon Singletary. Anthro. Adam Jaspon. Hi, uh, this is Adam Jaspin. Um, I'd just like to speak in support of the uh, proposal. Um, familiar with the applicants. Um, I think the community would be very lucky to have people and business owners of their caliber. Um, I am a Dorchester resident. Uh, I live at 16 Train Street. I'm also a business owner in the city. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, Paulina Vineski. Trevor? Is Trevor present? Shabon. Is Shabon present? Nuosi? Is Priscilla Flint Banks present? Hello. Go ahead, please. Hi, this is Priscilla Flint Banks. Um, I'm traveling, that's why you can't, oh, okay, you can see me. Um, I um, thank you all for this hearing, and I'm here to say that I do support um, Ms. Um, Crawford's um, um, occupancy of this business. Um, I have worked with Cheryl for close to 10 years, maybe more, and um, she's done a lot of work in our community and for our community. And I know that she wants to help continue to work within our community. So that's all I have to say. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this matter? Seeing no one. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? Just have a quick question. Is this a multifamily house in the corner of Washington and Dunlop, is it the blue house? I pull yes, it up on the map? Okay, is it currently a residential? No, no, it's not. No. It's been used as a commercial building. Uh, it's in a local uh, community building and probably once upon a time was a residential building, but the upper floors are used for offices and would be unrelated to this uh, use. Okay. All right, thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any qu additional questions for the applicant? Oops, I hit the wrong button. No, I do not. Commissioner Lombos? No, I don't, thanks. Commissioner Smith? No, thank you. Commissioner Sankian? No. Thank you, the board will take this matter under advisement and vote on it next Wednesday. The record will be kept open until Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Calling Legal Greens LLC, the proposed license premise is 693 Dudley Street. The license type is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. As an equity applicant, the initial application was filed May 14, 2019. Filing with Inspectional Services was June 25, 2019. The date of the community meeting was September 4, 2019. The presentation team is Janessa, Vanessa Jean Baptiste, co owner, Michael Maloney, co owner, and Mark Bouquet, co owner. Is the applicant present? Yes, yes we, we are. are. Good afternoon. As a reminder, you will have 10 minutes to present. Jasmine Wynn will note the five minute mark and the two minute mark. Thank you. So, I would like to thank the Boston Cannabis Board for allowing us to present our proposed location at 693 Dudley Street. Next slide, please. This is our location, our proposed location. Next slide, please. My name is Vanessa Jean Baptiste. I went to Sacred Heart and Amazing, and Amazing Grace School in High Park. However, I spent the rest of my schooling in Brockton. My mother was a 30 year, 30 year special ed teacher in Boston, and my dad drives the Boston Public School kids to, to school. Um, I've worked in the Nashua Street Jail as a caseworker. I currently have a bachelor's in criminal justice and I'm enrolled in law school. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Maloney. I am a criminal defense attorney with offices in Brockton and Boston. I've been living in and around Boston for the entirety of my life. I went to New England School of Law, and it is an honor to be uh, part of the, to be part of this team. Hi, my name is Mark Bouquet, co-owner and chief operating officer of Legal Greens. Prior to Legal Greens, I ran Familiar Grocery Store, which is a family-owned business. Prior to that, I worked for Walgreens for 11 years, uh, starting as a cashier and worked my way up to a store manager running a team around 25 to 35 employees. I've had about 15 years of hands-on retail experience and I believe I have what it takes to run a cannabis retail establishment. Um, as being a victim of the war on drugs, I understand the importance of having a solid impact plan and a diverse and inclusive, that an impact plan that is diverse and inclusive uh, for individuals that was affected by the war on drugs, minorities, women, vets and uh, people with disabilities. Our goal is to eliminate and prevent reoccurrence of systematic discriminatory practices relating to employment or access to promotion. We also plan on having a, a program that will do a workshop for three hours in Boston, which will answer questions and guide individuals that are looking to get into the cannabis industry. We'll be able to measure that by counting the amount of people that come in and the people that actually go through the whole process and know and when we feel they are comfortable to go through the cannabis process uh, with the Cannabis Control Commission, ensuring that 51 to 75% of individuals fall within that goal. Uh, just to throw this in, currently we're working on a Brockton location and we have right now in total hired 90% that are minority owned businesses, women and vets and um, yeah, next slide, please. This is what we propose to have the current location look like. It's just a rendering. Uh, we, we're definitely going to uh, revitalize the area by doing renovations and keeping it clean and secure. Next. All right, so we plan on um, commencing operations uh in winter 2021 we plan on hiring 16 local residents right for employment right within the uppums corner community so again we we put a 50 to 75 percent threshold but we are planning to exceed that um we're going to have part-time and full-time positions uh 17 dollars and up with work benefits uh hours of operation is 11 a.m to 8 p.m seven days a week, and we'll only allow customers over the age of 21 to come. Next. 
uh, traffic control. So we plan on having a police detail uh, the, the first 90 days of the business to uh, make sure that customers are not parking right in front of 693 yeah, Dudley Street. <laughs> So 639, yeah, 693 Dudley Street. Um, and uh, just to not cause um, any extra excess, uh, excessive traffic, that was uh, some of the concerns of people in the community. Um, as for transportation, the commuter rail is literally walking distance 50 feet away from our location. We have a few bus stops, uh, um, a few buses that run along the, the Dudley Street and that connect to it as well that operate every day of the week. Sunday through Sunday. Next. That slide that looked around. weird. Um, well, we have uh, six parking spots back there with the handicap, so I can't really be seen right there, but we, based on what COVID um, allows us to do, we planned on having a valet parking where customers would come in. Uh, we would have a employee park the car for them and they go in there purchase and when they're ready to come out um they've had their car ready for them to to leave uh next five minute warning mm -hmm. thank you we have parking on belton street uh which is literally 824 feet away from our location it shows it on the map right across the street from it on belton street next slide you see there's more parking, which, about, which is about 611 feet away from us. Uh, next. So the Boston's buffer zone, uh, it requires us to be 500 feet away from K-2 and private schools and uh, K through the 12 private schools. Uh, we definitely fall within that buffer zone. Uh, we don't have any issues there. Uh, within half a mile of an existing cannabis establishment, we have uh, two, so next slide. next slide, there's a medical company and there's also Mass Citizens for Social Equity, which literally just got um, approved by the board uh, about a month ago. Um, you could go to the next slide after that. Oh, I just, uh, yeah, yeah, next slide. Yep, this is NA, NSAJO Holdings, which are the medical company. Yeah, you go back. They're a medical company that is located in the New Market Industrial District. Um, the other equity applicant that um, was previous, they're located in the Roxbury District, and we're in Upham's Corner District. So, so as you can see, just in this picture right here, it's like highly dense. Uh, it's a highly dense area. So we're gonna give. Um, if you would give a conditional license, uh, we believe that it, it'd be nice to go in a highly dense area where there's um, a lot of people. Next. Our security plan, um, we plan to have it well lit in, in the inside and outside. Again, we plan to have police detail for the next 90 days, but we will extend it depending on how it goes or we will go to um, a private security company. We plan to have security cameras running 24 seven inside and out the, inside and out the facility. We, we want to maintain the business flow. As far as children coming inside, we will make sure that each customer will show their ID at least three times. Next slide, please. To uh, prevent diversion, we, to, yeah, to prevent, uh, sorry, to prevent diversion, we plan to have the logos and the designs not appeal to children that are under, or people under 21. Um, as far as money transporting, we want to get a private security company to handle that. And for our products, we want to handle, we want that to be handled by licensed cultivators. Um, again, when it comes to tracking it, we're going to do the seed to sale like the state wants us to, and that will that will maintain all the products being where it's supposed to be and not having children get it. And if any of our employees violate that, they will be fired and they will be reported to the state as well. Next Two slide. minute warning. Sure, thank you. Nope, go up, please. Thank you. Um, and to prevent, to prevent any other issues with customers, with loitering or littering and smoking and dispensing it to children, everybody will sign a contract that states that if they 
violate these things, they will A, be reported to the state and we will no longer serve to them as well. Next slide. And this is just our timeline. We filed the application like, like um, what we stated before in May 2019 and we got our city council um, approval letter in October. We would hopefully like to get our post agreement within this month or next month. And um, we plan to open within October of November of 21. Next slide, please. And there we go. Our beginning location and what we plan to do with the location. Any questions? Thank you for the opportunity. Chairman, do you have any questions for the applicant? I don't have any questions at this point. I defer to my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions for the applicant? Hi, sorry. Hey, can you all talk a little bit about your employment plan? How many are planning to employ your outreach? You know. Yeah, so we, we plan on so I again, I, when I said I have 15 years of retail experience um, uh, working at Walgreens, uh, depending on the area I was working in, uh, we, we definitely uh, put a lot of work and well, I did to hiring minorities and people of color uh, that, you know, were that had less opportunity. So um, the, the goal says 50 to 75 percent, but I always try to exceed that. Like I said, currently right now in our Brockton location, we've went above and beyond to look for contractors and general contractors and, and people of color and women to work. And counted right now, it's 90% um, of in that category. So how many people work in Brockton? The, they're just, Brockton. we're going through renovations. We're right doing now. the build out right now, sir. You're doing the build out right now, okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. But we have over 90 percent. 90 percent hired. Yes. And sir, just in regard, I believe I also the part of the core of your question was in regards to outreach. I, I mentioned before I'm a criminal defense attorney with offices in downtown Boston and downtown Brockton. I've been the keynote speaker for the past two years. This most uh, uh, Massachusetts expungement clinic, uh, which the expungements are brand new in Massachusetts versus a uh, typical ceiling. Um, and I say that because obviously there's a, you know, the cannabis industry is littered with individuals who have been adversely affected. Uh, last year, uh, 2019, it was done in Quincy. Uh, and this past year, was, it was held in Springfield, but it was, you know, virtu it was done virtually. Um, and I will continue to do that. And Legal Greens will continue to you know, help facilitate that on a, a larger scale to help more people that have been adversely affected. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do. Uh, first of all, um, police details aren't guaranteed. It's nice that you want to hire them for 90 days, but they're not guaranteed you're going to get one every day. What is your plan when that does not happen? We do plan on hiring a, a security company to be there uh, day to day. So the police detail was it's more for like traffic, traffic control for outside when we first open up. Nope, I understand that, but just because you apply for one does not mean you're going to get one. So what is your second plan if you don't get that detail filled for the traffic post that day? So then our security company, because we plan to have two, will be inside and outside. So the one that's outside will be handling the traffic control, and then we'll have somebody that will be dealing with the IDs to get somebody inside. Okay, great. And the second question, you said you're going to have valets. Um, who are they going to be? Are they going to be licensed and bonded? I mean, a little unnerving to just give your car keys up to someone. So, I mean, if you're going to do valets, I would just suggest that you use a reputable company. 100%. They will be fully licensed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do, I just have one. I really appreciate the high goals of the diversity and inclusion. It's great to hear, Mark, your experience in recruitment and retention of your employees over 
um, where you've worked before in your experience. I just, can you just elaborate a little bit more about $17 for workers and then plus benefits? What are the other benefits that you all have discussed for workers and the retention plan? You, I'm sorry, the, it broke up for a split second. Could you please repeat your question? Oh, I was just asking what the, what the, for the $17 an hour, um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the benefits package? Uh, certainly. Well, I, I should start off by saying uh, I don't think they're 100% defined at this point, but they would be tiered in regards to full-time employment versus part-time employment, uh, which I, you know, whatever the state standard is in regards to 35 or 40 hours, which is a full-time employee with benefits at that point. Um, but again, this nothing is set in stone. We welcome pushback. We welcome suggestions from the board. Uh, we just want to make it abundantly clear that, you know, uh, we're not looking to just reach the threshold we're looking to run a very professional well-run organization that rewards its employees please fill in guys like i said we don't nothing is set in stone uh, but based on full-time versus part-time i think would be the distinct characteristic between who would who would receive full benefits and we're yeah. working with the company as well hr well, oh yeah yeah health insurance like dental just just the regular stuff not nothing like I know we said bonus, but it's just the, you know, health insurance, dental, that good stuff. Okay, thank you so much. Commissioner St. Guillen, do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, just, just quickly, as you mentioned, you're um, not within a buffer zone of a, of a current operating uh, establishment, but within one that recently got approved, the uh, Mass Citizens for Social Equity. How far, how far are you from that establishment? 0.28. Point two eight. Uh, and has there been any um, feedback or concern from the community uh, since their approval about having um, establishments so close? No, no, we, no, we have because not. we've gone through the process with them. So okay, it's never been like you or I. It's just they want somebody or a com companies that are going to help the community. Oh, great! So it's like a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be confirming those distances on the buffer zone as well. Understood. Kayla White, could you please testify to the equity certification? Yes. Um, Ms. Uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, is the 51% beneficial interest holder of Legal Greens. Um, and she submitted documentation that uh, establishes that she meets three of the criteria set forth in the ordinance establishing equitable regulation of the cannabis industry in Boston. Um, the first criteria that she met is a person who resided in an area of disproportionate impact as defined by the CCC for at least five of the past 10 years. Ms. Jean-Baptiste uh, submitted copies of her driver's license, um, a letter from uh, the executive director of the city of Brockton's elections commission, um, as well as some other documentation, which, which established that she's lived in Brockton for um, at least uh, the past five years. Um, additionally, she self-identifies as black and of Haitian descent. Um, and finally, she qualified as a person whose annual income uh, is at or below 100% of the area median income. Uh, she did submit um, documentation that established that um, she did not uh, receive an income in 2019, um, and there is additional documentation uh, to substantiate that if there are any questions about that. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce or commissioners, do you have any questions regarding the equity certification? No, oh, thank you. Seeing no questions, we will turn to public testimony beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Is there anyone here who wishes to testify? Yes, uh, this is Jessica Thomas from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, during the community process, um, my office received 201 support letters, um, which included 128 signatures from Boston residents and 55 signatures from direct the butters. Uh, we held a community meeting on September 4th, 2019, and we'd like to go on record to support the project. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives who wish to testify? 
Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Julie Ryan from City Councilor Frank Baker's office, and the councilor would like to go on record in support of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application? Seeing no one, Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions for additional questions for the applicant? Um, it's either for the applicant or for you, Leslie. So we will get a, a buffer zone attestation um, from them after the hearing. Yes, we will. Okay. Commissioner Smith, do you have any additional questions? Yes, sorry, I just need clarity on one thing. So in the, and it's based on what Commissioner Holmes asked, you, you said that you have the police detail first for 90 days and then the security company, right? No, we're gonna do them parallel now that you- They're have, gonna be parallel? Yeah. Okay, because the presentation said security 90 days, I mean, uh, police 90 days, then security. Yeah, okay. we're, with the comments, I feel like we should amend that and have them together, just like she said, because we could apply for it and not get that I. This okay. is our rodeo, so I've never <laughs> applied for a police detail. <laughs> okay, just wanted to gain some clarity. Thanks a lot. And not to jump in, but to echo what both the commissioners just said, in the liquor licensing world, we find this all the time. Um, restaurants or bars sign up for a police detail and there isn't one available. So the onus and the burden is on the licensee to make sure that they have proper security. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any other questions? No, I would just encourage the applicants um, to have a little bit more robust details on some of the, the things. In the, um, I would specifically love to see how you're thinking about just um, worker benefits, retention, um, worker voice, those kinds of things. It would be in the in as you know um, in, in these in the jo in retail jobs particularly. Um, it would be good to hear what your plans are to make sure that people, um, uh, workers are uh, both have a voice and um, have a say in their workplace. So I, I feel um, your application uh, feels like you're committed to that. And I would just love to see a few more details. So thanks. Thank you. Understood. Commissioner Holmes, did you have any additional questions? No, ma'am. I'm all set. Thank you. Commissioner St. Guillen. I'm all set, thank you. Thank you, the board will take this matter under advisement. Thank you. Thank you, be well. Calling Fairway Botanicals, Inc., doing business as The Hempist. The proposed location is 882 to 886 South Street. The license type is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is a non-equity applicant. The date of initial application is July 20th, 2018. The date of filing with Inspectional Services is August 29th, 2018. The date of the community meeting is December 5th, 2018. The presentation team is Mitch Rosenfield, CEO, and Rick Oberson, COO. Is the applicant present? Yes, we are. As a reminder, you will have 10 minutes. Jasmine Wynn will give you notification at the five minute mark and the two minute mark. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks so much to the board for having us on the agenda today and to hear our proposal for an adult use retail cannabis facility at 882 South Street in Rosendale. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background about myself and Rick Oveson. Um, we both live in the neighborhood right around the corner from this facility. Uh, I have lived here for 10 years. Uh, Rick has lived here his entire life. Uh, his, his neighbor, his family has roots going back in his neighborhood about 80 years. Um, and I've lived in Boston for 23 years uh, ten, in this neighborhood. Uh, we both have young children. I have a seven year old daughter. Rick has two young sons, age five and eight. Uh, and we consider ourselves very active residents of the Rosendale community. Um, uh, I also opened up uh, the Hempist clothing store back in 1997, which I think you could date back as being perhaps the first cannabis business in the state of Massachusetts. So um, it's been a long, long road to get here. Uh, the entire focus of our business 
was in changing marijuana laws. Uh, I re we recognized a long, long time ago that these laws were very damaging to a lot of people. And I fought for you know, over two decades trying to change that and worked with groups like Normal, uh, the Hemp Industries Association, MathTan, Drug Policy Alliance, and Marijuana Policy Project, doing signature drives, fundraisers, um, and donating money to the cause of changing marijuana laws. We were thrilled to see that take place in 2008 with decriminalization, 2012 with medical, and again in 2016. Uh, I think it's important to realize that you know, some people are not in this as a get-rich-quick scheme. This has been uh, 23 years of hard work coming to fruition in a project like this. And it, uh, you know, brings me to today, uh, which I'm very glad to be here and be able to present this, uh, this presentation. Um, so Rick approached me about this spot in June of 2018. Uh, his family owns the property and has owned it uh, since 1981. Uh, it's been looking like this pretty much uh, the entire time. It's been in a state of disrepair. It has been primarily used for storage for his father's plumbing business. Um, in 2018, we decided to work together on a spot to try to renovate it and make something great there. Um, and then we decided to present in, in uh, July of 2018 to the LANA, which is the Longfellow Area Neighborhood Association. Uh, we were well received by the board. We received unanimous non-opposition from the neighborhood group and we decided to go for it. So we submitted our application on July 20th and in July and August, we hired BKA Architects uh, out of Brockton who is, uh, had a lot of experience designing facilities for the cannabis industry and with a lot of specific uh, attention to detail and code that is required by the CCC and some of the most stringent requirements uh, that you'll find in any building anywhere. Um, and if we can go on to the next slide, we want to turn this facility into this facility, uh, which uh, I think anybody can kind of recognize as, as an improvement. The, that block that we're on, is, is a, it's a great block. It's very small group of commercial zone property. Um, and it, it recently had a coffee shop, which was in a similar state of disrepair that you know, was renovated into a beautiful coffee shop. Uh, now that's like a bustling, uh, you know, a bustling new center for, for the neighborhood. Right next door to this is a Chinese food restaurant, which we are going to renovate their storefront as well. Uh, and then next door to that is a beer, wine, convenience store. And next door to that is the pizza place. And that's essentially the only thing on that block. It's a small little zone commercial area. Uh, and we, you know, think adding a little boutique, uh, adult use cannabis facility that would be just a perfect addition to people in this neighborhood who voted higher than, uh, or as high as any other neighborhood in Boston in favor for cannabis legalization at I think 69% was what this district voted at. Um, we can go on to the next slide. This is what we propose the interior to look like. Um, we're kind of going to uh, an upscale but natural look, uh, a lot of wood, um, we, we don't want this to be like a smoke shop vibe or an Apple store vibe. We kind of want to give it a really natural, healthy look and display, you know, top shelf cannabis products um, for our customers. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. This is um, the architectural and security drawings. Uh, we've hired uh, Platinum Security, uh, who has designed a number of security systems for cannabis buildings in Massachusetts, including cultivation, recreational, uh, medical facilities, and manufacturing. Uh, the cameras, you see those little red dots, there's approximately 18 camera, 12 to 18 cameras in this facility, which include the upstairs, downstairs, and exterior of the building. And by CCC regulations, 100% of the premise needs to be covered by security cameras. Uh, so, you know, basically these- Five minute warning. Thank you. Uh, these buildings have tighter security than just about any facility you will find in the city of Boston, including banks or, you know, until we get to the Federal Reserve or something like that. Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, that's just the architectural drawings. The, to the left is the first floor, uh, which we're going to have about, we're thinking four to six POS systems, which we think will be adequate in getting people in and out in a, in a speedy manner. We anticipate a five to 10 minute transaction time. Um, and on the right, you'll see the, that's the basement. 
The vault will be in the basement, which is the most secure space for a vault to be. Um, and there's a lot of regulation that I can get into uh, if anybody has specifics on that. But uh, all, the, all the cannabis product every day has to be returned to the vault. The CCC has incredibly strict requirements on that. Uh, and everything is on camera. So uh, it's an extremely, extremely secure facility. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, this is something I know everybody wants to talk about and we talk about as especially since we're not an equity candidate, but uh, I'd really like to bring up the point that there is no better way for equity and inclusion than being local and having local ownership. We literally live right around the corner from this facility. Uh, we have a vested interest in this community. We love Rosendale because it's synonymous with diversity and inclusion. Uh, of all the neighborhoods in Boston, I, I mean, I can't think of one that's, that's more inclusive of all different walks of life and, and minorities. Uh, every, every walk of life pretty much is represented in Rosendale, and it's what makes the community what it is and why we chose to live there. Um, you know, we are dealing with somebody who's had a 20-year history of, of fighting unfair cannabis laws and who believes in in that equity and in helping those who have been damaged by unfair marijuana laws. Uh, our written goals are one-to-one -one hiring of equity and minority candidates to non-equity uh, or non-minorities. Um, we don't think we'll have a problem with this at all in Rosendale. Um, we're, we're shooting for 90% plus uh, Boston residents, you know, starting with Rick and myself living right around the corner. And uh, we're, we're gonna try and hire as much as possible right within our neighborhood. Uh, we have spoken and reached out to, to ABCD Head Start of Rosendale Village. Uh, they're a great program that works with, um, that does child care and education uh, in support of low income families in the inner city. Uh, we're also already doing a pro, I'm also working on a project in Northampton, Mass. A, I'm part owner in a uh, adult use site out there. And we are part of our uh, positive impact plan is to work with uh, the beautification of Nubian Square. Uh, we're gonna be uh, doing plantings and things like that. And what we really, wanna have, we really wanna have is volunteer days. Uh, we wanna to try to make it mandatory for all of our employees to do at least one volunteer day with one of these organizations because we think that's the best way for people to truly understand what equity and inclusion is all about. Um, and lastly, our dollars are staying local, which means they support local. And I don't think there's anything more powerful than that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is to demo the, the biggest um, opposition we seem to face uh, in our community outreach reading was parking. Um, and strangely enough, I feel this place has more parking than any other spot I've seen in Boston. This is the commuter rail spot. Um, parking lot, which on a Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, that's one of the busiest hours for a dispensary. And this spot is looks like this every Saturday and every Sunday. Um, so this is 800 feet from our building. Um, and we can go to the next slide. We have done eight different park parking counts. Um, this was sort of a, there's, you don't have to pay attention to the picture on the right, but the picture on the left is our facility, the red dot. Um, I actually live at the blue dot there. And you'll see there's a ton of street parking and a, an interesting traffic pattern that allows for a lot of different directions for people to come in or get out of our location. Um, we have done eight different parking counts at this location. And in, within a quarter mile radius of this facility, we have never found less than 200 open uh, parking spaces. So there's literally, I can't think of a space place in Boston. This is mostly houses with driveways and you'll see there's just tons of streets um, going in every direction here that makes it very easy to park. Um, I parked there. That's time, that's 10 minutes. Thank you very much, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do. Um, Mitch, how long has the Northampton location been operating? The Northampton location, we received our provisional license. I'm actually out here right now. Uh, we are going, we, we just had a big security briefing, but we are the post-provisional license. Uh, we are submitting for 
our post provisional license inspection at the end of this week and we hope to have uh, we hope to be open and running at some time in probably December um, December might be a little optimistic but it's a it's a time it's a time consuming process with the CCC so okay and just one other question in your diversity and inclusion plan um, you specifically seek to maintain a one-to-one -one hiring ratio of minorities, women, veterans, and immigrants to non-minorities. What does that mean to you? You're gonna hire 50%, like how, how is that working out? You're gonna hire right. one, non -min one minority and then you won't hire another one until you hire? Exactly, a minimum of 50% of um, would, would be, exactly, would be female, um, you know, uh, people of color, uh, we think we think we'll have a very. I mean, based on the census for the Rosendale area, um, which is that you know that's sort of reflective of that. I think we'll have an easy time meeting meeting those goals. But how does that work in practice? Like for example, when we put this agenda together, we have to put we cannot hear a non equity applicant until we have an equity applicant ready to go. So would you not hire a non equity person until you had a minority women veterans immigrants? Like are you literally going to go one to one to one to one to one? Yes. That, that is the plan that we have to do. And I, I don't think we'll have too much of a problem doing it. We've, we've already reached out. Our security company is uh, Westcon Security, which is a local minority owned security company. Um, Mark Conrad is the owner. He's had a 30 year history in the, in the Boston police and, and uh, maybe another police force and has worked with a few uh, different cannabis facilities in the area. And we're hoping to depending on, on what it's going to cost and everything, we're hoping to contract the entire security detail to them, um, which would already take care of, you know, uh, three to four security jobs and, and be people of color uh, because he's specific, he's sort of specifies in that in his, in his business, which has been great. Okay, thank you. Questions for the applicant? I'm a, I'm a little confused. I thought he named Platinum Security Firm earlier. Yeah, yeah Platinum Security is designed our security system and the layout of security. Uh, Westcon Security is actually a security firm that actually we contract out and they assume all liability for doing the detail for, they take responsibility for making sure every ID is checked properly, for making sure there's nobody loitering outside for, they, they basically staff as needed um, based on a lot more security, uh, you know, history than I have. These guys know security a lot better than I do. So rather than me making those decisions, we want to contract that out to a professional that's going to make those decisions. And, and one more thing about the parking. You, 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 you using the commuter rail parking lot as an example of where you can park, but that's on a Saturday, Monday through Friday, they don't allow outside people to park in those commuter rail spots. So no, that's true. And I, I meant to mention on the other side of, of the commuter rail parking is a municipal lot that often has empty spaces. It's very close the municipal. I mean, the, the train lots about 800 feet the municipal the municipals on the other side of that. Um, there is lots of street parking around and we're also Rosendale we have we have uh, two bus stops within 100 yards of the facility um, and we have dozens of uh, bus routes that stop in Rosendale Village which is about you know a thousand feet from the facility too. Uh, and which, and commuter rail commuter rail. which commuter rail stop is this? Uh, Rosendale Village. Behind the circle? Uh, well, the, the commuter rail stops at the circle. We're straight down the street from the commuter rails, is, and you run into South Street. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you. In the employment plan, you wrote that the applicant is entirely locally owned and the owners live approximately one quarter mile. But you also write the applicant plans on only hiring non Boston residents. Non-Boston residents, no. <laughs> that's a typo, right? <laughs> that's a big typo. That was my question. <laughs> no, Boston residents, not non-Boston residents. Okay, because it says non-Boston residents. I was yeah, a little sorry. bit interested in that. And the second question is, um, you talked about you previously worked with C3RN. Yes. Um, and you're currently looking for new operators. Have you identified any? How are you doing that? How is that going? 
I have not yet. Um, that's, it's, it's funny because I've reached out to several people about that and I, and I talked to, uh, I talked to city council Arroyo too and said, you know, if they have any, uh, if they have any resources like that, that, that they could send my way, that would be great too. Um, but basically I'm not sure if you're familiar with C3RN, um, but that was, they were, they were being trained. Um, uh, they were going to be a vendor where they actually did training for people that work directly with people who had been harmed by cannabis laws. Um, and yeah, I haven't found that resource yet, but, um, there, you know, I, that's what we hope to do is find a resource. I do have a, a friend that's a criminal attorney, a criminal defense attorney, and he says he thinks he could probably, you know, talk to a few other defense attorneys and get some people together that have gone through that experience and had um, marijuana arrests. But that's something I'm very committed to do. I, I really want to right those wrongs that have, that have happened. It's why I've got into this business. Yeah, just, just pointing it out because I'm hoping it's just not aspirational but it can no, actually be no. implemented, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lombos. Do you have any questions? Not anymore, as long as you fix that typo. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> actually, I do, I would love to hear just a few more details about retention. You have such good goals and one-to-one, -one and um, but I would like to hear a little bit more about retention of your workers. Um, that's something that's always uh, a flag for me when there's such high goals and then such great recruitment pet plans and then how do you plan to retain them? Well, I mean, what we plan on is a starting salary of $17 for bud tenders or $17.50, I think. The, and that will go up to salary positions of up to probably $60,000. Um, we're going to have to see how business is. There's a lot of speculation right now, but as more of these places open, it gets a little difficult to, you know, our projections will be, will be fluctuating. So retention, we're going to have two weeks paid vacation and full health benefits um, for all full-time employees. And what we hope is that we will have room for bonuses. Now I've, I've run uh, businesses, retail businesses, like four, four different stores I've opened over the years and nothing's better for running retail than retention. It's what you, it's what you love. I, nothing's worse than having to hire new people all the time. Um, we're definitely going to be looking for, to build a solid local team that, you know, that is in this for the long haul. And I think if we, if we can start at a reasonable salary where we can get our feet off the ground, I think that that bonuses, um, you know, where we obviously want to share the wealth as if, if things do well, um, I think that's the best way to, to maintain retention. Okay, hey, thank you. Commissioner St. Guillen, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. So I wanted to kind of dive a little bit into the um, data. Again, I know uh, Chairwoman asked about the the one-to-one, -one, but I think if you, when you group uh, people of color, women, veterans, immigrants, all in one group, you could still have a, a workforce that isn't necessarily reflective of not the demographics of the city or the demographics of um, the community. I believe Rosendale, I could be wrong, it's about 63% people of color and a, a large percentage of, of Latinos. So I would love to see um, maybe a diversity plan with goals that are a little more ambitious in terms of actually hiring people of color and people disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, I think you can, as you mentioned, achieve it in, in I think you can achieve those goals where, where you're located um, so close, you know, to parts of uh, Rosendale as well as JP that that you could have a lot of people who um, meet that criteria and I would also say to encourage that within your leadership as well uh, would be I think would be really important um, and then with the with the security it says that so it's it's minority owned and um, and I and I know Mark so I know that you know commitment to to hiring uh, people of color but then it says your commitment is only 20% of them, and if you only have... No, basically I said that the security jobs will be five jobs or so. 
Um, so that's going to be about 20% of our workforce. We're okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. We're I thought it was 20% of the security force, and I thought <laughs> well, that's only like one person. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I. So I think. So that was my. It was more. I guess more of a comment than a, than a question is that when you when um, you know as we think about those who it's not it commitment to equity, particularly as it relates to those who were negatively impacted by the war on drugs and that is in particularly uh, black and Latino men. Um, mm -hmm. I would really look at those, you know, those hiring uh, goals to be a little more specific uh, within those within those demographics. That's Happy beer. <laughs> Happy beer. Thank you. Thank We'll now move to public testimony. For the record, we did receive something in the chat uh, regarding the public notice. This hearing received uh, more than the required legal 48 hour public notice. It was noticed the week prior, posted on both the city clerk site, the cannabis board's website, and distributed to uh, various city agencies. I also want to note that the record will be kept open for public testimony uh, up until Wednesday at 10 a.m. With that, are there any individuals who wish to testify regarding this application, beginning with elected officials or their representatives? Good afternoon, members of the Cannabis Board. This is Joe Coppinger with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. We would like to go on record in support of this proposal. Throughout the community process, we received a lot of supportive comments about uh, Ricky and Mitch being locally owned business owners. Um, they also received letters of non-opposition from the Longfellow Area Neighborhood Association, Rosendale Village Main Streets, as well as a letter of support from former city councilor Tim McCarthy. Uh, we would also like to note that they did receive a number of opposition emails with concerns regarding, to the, uh, regarding the proximity of this location to Fallon Field, the senior housing across the street, as well as parking concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives who wish to testify? Are there any other individuals who wish to testify regarding this matter? Please remember to keep your comments limited to two minutes. State your name, your address, and your affiliation, if any. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this matter? Seeing no one, Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any other questions? I don't at this time, thank you. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Holmes? Commissioner Lombos? Commissioner St. Guillen? Board will take this matter under advisement. We will take a three minute recess before the next item.
Okay, we will resume. Calling Urba C3 Dorchester LLC. The proposed license premise is 43 Freeport Street. The license type is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. This is a certified equity applicant. The date of the initial application is February 26, 2020. The date of filing with Inspectional Services Department is February 19, 2020. The date of the community meeting is August 20, 2020. The presentation team is Ancor Runka, owner, Brian Chavez, owner, Michael Ross, attorney, Daniel Glissman, attorney. Is the applicant present? Yes. We are. As um, a you will have 10 minutes. Jasmine Wynn will notify you at the five minute mark and the two minute mark. Madam Chair, I'm turning over the uh, presentation to Brian Chavez. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, mem honorable members of the board and the public for attending. Um, pardon, for some reason, I'm having some technical difficulties with my camera, but um, I, I will proceed. And I'm just gonna be mindful of the board's time. <clears throat> so for this uh, establishment is for 43 Freeport Street. Uh, and the dispensary will be called Herba. Next slide, please. All right, so just gonna go to a quick, uh, give you a quick overview on how this uh, company came about. So very simple terms, My, our company, Massachusetts Citizens for Social Equity, will be 51% owner of this entity, coupled with uh, C3 Industries, which will be 49% ownership and um, will make up Herba. This partnership uh, came about, to give you a little bit of context, came about with an introduction in the community. And uh, after learning about C3's leadership and their track record, uh, their story resonated uh, a lot with me and my brother. Um, for example, uh, we are, you know, they, we are both, both groups, MCSC and C3, where the children of immigrants, my parents came from Dominican Republic, and uh, Encore and Vishal's parents came from India, both uh, to pursue the American dream. And we're both made up of brother duo teams that, um, that have a passion for the cannabis industry and interest. Next slide, please. All right, so as like myself and uh, you guys have, have, to the people that don't know, I'm Brian Chavez, president and CEO of MCSC. My brother is the COO, Jason Chavez, it has experience in the cannabis industry in California and our community outreach director, Desiree Frangel. Next slide, please. And I wanna turn this over to Encore to uh, introduce himself in C3. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you to the board for allowing us to present today. Uh, just a quick background of the company. Uh, C3, as Brian mentioned, was founded by my brother Vishal and I and our third partner, Joel Ruggiero. Uh, we're a family run business, we're a private company uh, based in Michigan, and we have operations in a few different states and a long track record of, of strong operations in the licensed cannabis industry. Um, in Massachusetts, we're building a facility in Franklin for cultivation and processing, and we also have retail locations in Berlin and Natick. Um, we've been working in the Dorchester community for almost two years pursuing cannabis retail. Uh, we originally had a site before this, and uh, what we ultimately realized is that the, the right way to come into the Boston market is with a strong local partner that uh, has a track record in the community and has the trust of the community. Um, and we were introduced to Brian and Jason and, and we really felt a strong chemistry between them and us and our two companies. Um, and we're excited to work with them and partner with them. And, and this is in their backyard, of course, as a community where they grew up. Um, and we'll focus primarily in this partnership on the back end, on the licensing, compliance, real estate, things like that. And Brian will really take the lead on the customer facing and community facing sides of the business. Uh, Brian, back to you. Next slide, please. Thank you, uh, Encore. And, and I would just like to add that uh, with this partnership, uh, one reason why we were comfortable, why we welcomed it, is that Encore and his brother Vishal have experience and success in cannabis operations. And us being equity out applicants, having access to the technical assistance, couple that with their experience, I feel like this is gonna be a recipe for success. Um, the timeline two things. We filed in February 2020. We're at the blue dot at the BCB hearing today. 
One thing that I would like to point out prior to filing with the city, this November 2019, December 2019, we were already conducting community outreach. And uh, I just like to note that, you know, that we engaged the community prior to filing. Next slide, please. So we're going to just go over uh, to the site. Um, the site right now, 43 Freeport Street, you see images of how the facility looks now. It's going to be 4,000 square feet. Our proposed hours are from 10 to 9. Uh, big thing, we plan to employ 30 employees that are locally hired in the neighborhood, walking distance, community distance away. And what I really love about this site is the amount of parking. There's 42 spaces in total, at least 24 are gonna be designated for our use. And anybody, you know, and um, as you can see, the aerial, view, the, the aerial view, what's really great um, about this facility is that um, uh, it doesn't have any residential uh, uh, area. Next no, slide, please. Next week. Um, so. Oh, no, so we had um, sites. Pardon? Five minute warning. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can we can we mute people's lines? Who are um, yeah, it's the Hempest. We have uh, one more. Uh, mute, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's all about that. It's Ricardo Arroyo. He uh, sent a letter of support. Chairwoman um, Joyce. Uh, and they had a meeting uh, to the on, in okay. 2018 with the community and January 30th, 2019. All right. One second. All right. Mm. Okay. It's like a big building. Um, I'll, I'll take a close. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Um, all right. Like I was saying, that this site is great. I think it's one of the best sites in the city. Look at the aerial view. Go by the neighborhood. Drive by it now. There's no sensitive sites and it doesn't abut any residential properties. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm just gonna be mindful for time. So left, the zone in the left image shows that we are in compliance with the 500 feet rule of the schools. The image to the right larger shows that we're not within a half mile of any existing cannabis establishment. More important to note, even within outside the law, like I just message uh, mentioned, there's no sensitive sites uh, uh, near this facility. I mean, I have people that supported this proposal that are against cannabis, but support this proposal because they love the location. It's not next to a daycare, a uh, bus stop with kids, school programs. Next slide, please. Uh, the floor plan, um, very quick overview. We have a sizable uh, waiting area in the front, uh, retail wait waiting area. We're going to have about 1,600 square foot of retail showroom space, but consistent with our other locations, there's not going to be any product or stock available in abundance on the showroom. Everything will be locked away and secure until it's procured by the uh, customer. Next slide, please. What I'm really excited is, is to show you the site improvements. Um, the left image shows the image, uh, the site it is now, 43 Freeport Street with the abutting parcel, which used to be Bob's Barker's Auto Sales. The image to the right shows how we're going to revitalize the site through site improvements, through green space, additional parking, um, and you know, uh, we're going to make it aesthetically look better to match a lot of the development that's coming, such as dot block in the area. And we're going to make this site that's what I call a dog. We're going to make it beautiful and blend in with the, uh, with the trend of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Okay. Again, images on your left, you know, the site, it is what it is. It's been like that for years. There's never anything that's thrived at that building. Um, and the images on the right shows the improvements and the beautification that we will be doing with the with this uh, site and along with the many job opportunities that we're going to provide. Next slide, please. Okay, um, next slide, please. So we can go to our diversity and inclusion plan. Uh, for our goals, I just want to tackle this head on. It's going to be 50% woman. It states minimum 25% of color. That's going to be scratched. We're going to keep it consistent with our other sites, at least 50% people of color. Um, 
ways that we're gonna measure this, uh, we're gonna retain the job advertisement data, the demographics of our employees, and you know how many uh, applicants we hire from these job for, uh, job fairs. Um, something that is different from our uh, from our other proposal is that we will be we want to provide educational grants of ten thousand or more for education and training in the um, in the cannabis industry. Two minute warning. Wanna, okay, next slide. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All right. So again, our employment plan at least fifty percent are going to be coming from Dorchester, seventy five at the minimum, Boston. The ownership is 67% owned by people of color. We're going to, for the wages and employment, we're going to go for the, we're going to go in adherence to the Boston Living Wage Ordinance. I believe that's about 1564 per hour. And for the hiring, consistent mass hire, operation exit program, and the mayor's office of returning citizens. And like I said, uh, community ties. I know we know people that have quarries in the community. And if they're eligible to work, we will extend that opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, this is our outsource, our security company, Minority Locally Owns. Next slide, please. Um, this is the security plan for the site. I just want to point a note. There's going to be four security personnel, personnel on site. Uh, they're, they're going to be staffed. They're going to be trained on security protocols and diversion protocols. And within an arm length distance away, there is a Boston police recruitment investigation station, meaning that there is already strong police presence um, uh, abating on that parcel on that block. Next slide, please. We have a traffic study conducted, uh, conducted by Hayes Engineering. We have 24 exclusive parking spaces. The traffic study showed that there will be minimal impact on the morning traffic and a little impact on the PM traffic. Um, anybody knows that street uh, there's an access to, to the highway we will be to negate traffic we will pass subsidies and membership of t pass and bike share memberships for all our employees next slide please here is our parking plan uh important thing to note the parcel next door to the facility will be torn down and will create 43 that's minutes. 10 minutes all right thank you And I want to just thank everybody for the opportunity to present. Thank you. Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any questions for the applicant? I do. Um, I, I just want to mention that there is a forthcoming application for a lab. At the, I think it's the exact same location. Um, and I want to know, would you be um, in support of a buffer zone um, variance at this, for that application? Would be we we are open to the other we're aware of the other applicant we're open to the other applicant being there, uh, and that's not an issue for us. That would be a decision for the board. Thank you, Mike. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions for the applicant? Not at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yes, thank you, Ancor. So there's an article in the. Uh, uh, Benzinga C3 Industries. So you guys are in Michigan, you're trying to expand into Missouri. You have a $36,000 square foot cultivation facility in Portland. You supply cloud cover cannabis products to over 150 dispensaries. It lists that you guys have raised over 40 million in capital. It's a pretty big operation. Um, successful, which is great. Um, so are you still thinking of yourself as sort of a minority or equity applicant or should we, how should we look at that? What would be your perspective? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Um, we, uh, C3 itself is not an equity applicant uh, in partnership with MCSC and as part of Urba, we're an equity applicant uh, by virtue of their majority ownership of this, of this partnership entity. Um, we certainly believe strong in equity principles. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I mean, my, my brother and I are children of immigrants. My, my parents came here in 1975 from India. My dad worked hard and was in the, in the auto industry and worked for Ford and GM for many years. And then uh, my brother and I went to school at the University of Michigan in state where our family lived. And ultimately, we built careers in the finance industry, really through our own hard work. Um, and uh, so we built this company. We're very proud of it. 
Um, we have raised capital. We do have operations in multiple states. I, I view that as a real positive here. I think that uh, I think that we can be very complimentary to what uh, Brian and Jason are trying to do. Uh, we are still a private business. Uh, Vishal and I uh, run the business. We we are the board members. We control it. Um, so we don't have outside investors that have uh, taken control of this this business. So uh, it's our company. It reflects our values and. Uh, and I think it really, it, it speaks to why we think this partnership with uh, Jason and Brian is so interesting uh, because we are two very similar sets of brothers. Um, we've had great success in this industry and, and I don't want to suggest otherwise. And, and I think we can bring a lot of positive experience into this partnership while still having the same type of focus that, that Brian and Jason do on, on bringing equity into the industry and, and hopefully about being a positive and contributing member of the, of the community that, that the two of them grew up in. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any questions? Yeah, I just have one question. Um, really appreciate you pushing up the 50 to percent people of color just to make it match with all the other um, businesses that Brian is part of. Um, did want to just have a question. You have great metrics on uh, recruitment. Just want to hear a little bit more about retention, as you know, in retail and, and in this industry. Um, just would love to see more. I'm, I'm glad you're hitting the living Boston living wage ordinance um, wage there. Uh, any other things that you want to talk about about worker voice or um, you know uh, cost of living increase or things that are really meant to think about or, or uh, training uh, career pathways, those kinds of things that are really part of retention of workers in this industry. And or encore, either one of you on that. Um, I, I think I'll take that. Uh, similar to in our app application, we'll be using the metrics to, to hire, but a key component that I feel like is essential in retention is what we spoke about in our last, in our last uh, proposals. We want to do like workforce development for our employees, similar to what I experienced at Year Up. You know, you learn about corporate etiquette email etiquette, industry best practices, you know, what makes a safe and inclusive environment. And, you know, j just so that uh, we can help develop our staff, so that as we develop our staff, we develop our company. And uh, if we don't do otherwise, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll leave it off there, Encore. Yeah, and I, I would just add one thing to that, Brian. Um, one thing that we've talked a lot about, Commissioner, with, with Brian and Jason is, is sort of being able to bring some of MCSEs employees into some of our other facilities and, and bringing them in even for some training, uh, maybe in some of our other facilities. And I think there's some really exciting opportunities for, uh, for synergy and, and for us to even bring some extra training from our experiences in other states into this particular location. And, and hopefully providing that training, that workforce development, hopefully will allow people to have longer career paths with us and, and even advance into other parts of our businesses. Obviously we have a broader business and Brian and Jason are building a, a very strong and interesting broader business now as well. Commissioner Sankian, do you have any questions for the applicant? Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the educational grants um, and uh, if there are any additional community benefits that you see or ways to support entrepreneurs. I do see this as a way of you know supporting the Chavez brothers who are starting out in this industry given your uh, track record but I do I do think that there might be opportunity for for more um, and so if there are any future um, if you if you think that the 10,000 is going to expand beyond just one person uh, whether it can expand upon something that's uh, much more substantial for entrepreneurs who might be able who want to open a business given your success and um, profit margins from across the country. Uh, sure, thank you. I, I think Brian, that question is directed to me, so I'll, I'll jump in and then if you would like to jump in after that. Um, I, th this is really a minimum from our standpoint. So this is a firm commitment for us to provide at least one grant uh, and at least $10,000 a year. Um, we'd like it to expand over time. I, I believe that uh, the, you know, with, with Brian and Jason and their other locations, we'll be able we'll have an opportunity to, to really expand this between all three of these stores. Um, we think that uh, supporting young entrepreneurs that want to come in the industry is one of the most exciting ways to bring 
equity into the business. And so uh, it, to me, this is the most, uh, uh, I think, meaningful uh, long-term aspect of what we want to do. Um, and, and we are absolutely open to expanding this over time. We just wanted to present what we think is just a minimum commitment here. And I think one of the other applicants mentioned it before. Um, we, I've, I've seen from other markets, it will get more competitive in Massachusetts. And so um, we don't want to make promises that we can't keep from a business standpoint later. Uh, so, uh, so we put this out as a minimum, but, but absolutely the intention would be to do more. And, and again, why I'm so interested in working with Brian, I mean, he, he's not just talking about these things. He's actually done these things for many years with his, with his other businesses. So uh, Brian, do you want to touch on any of that at all, please? Uh, yes. Thank you, Encore. And just uh, to say that the great question, Commissioner Guillang, and I appreciate it. Uh, to be really pilly back, we'd rather undercommit and overperform than underpromise, than overpromise, and then you know, uh, you know, and, and underperform basically. Like you know, I, our credibility is really important on the board. We want to come here every year, and what I pledge and what we commit to, I, I want to execute. So um, we will keep you informed. Thank you. Attorney Taylor White, could you please make your presentation regarding the equity certification? Yes, I can. But excuse me for one second, because my dog's about to start barking. Okay, I think the coast is clear. I'm sorry about that. So I was able to certify Irba as an equity applicant um, through uh, Mr. Chavez, who is an indirect beneficial uh, holder of Irba. Uh, he has a direct 100% beneficial interest in Massachusetts citizens for social equity, um, which is the 51% interest holder of Irba. Um, Mr. Chavez uh, met uh, four of the criteria set forth in the ordinance establishing equitable regulation of the cannabis industry in the city of Boston. Um, he is a person who has lived in an, in an area of disproportionate impact as defined by the CCC um, for the past 13 years, I believe. Yes, 13 years. Um, he was con uh, he has an arrest record from September 7th of 2012. When he was arrested for the possession of a uh, possession to distribute a class D substance marijuana. Um, again, a person who has resided in the city of Boston for the past seven years. Again, he has resided in Boston for the past 13 years. Um, and uh, Mr. Chavez has self identified as Latino and Afro Caribbean. Uh, I have all of the documentation I need to substantiate these. Um, that he's met these criteria. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Chairwoman Joyce or commissioners, do you have any questions regarding the equity certification? No, thanks. No. Seeing no questions, we will turn to public testimony beginning with elected officials or their representatives. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak in support of this application? Madam Chair, members of the board, Patrick Fandel, Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services, we'd like to go on record in support of this applicant. Um, as existing stakeholders in the neighborhood, um, the applicants have gone above and beyond the required community process, um, reaching out to many of the area civic associations outside of the ones that this falls into the catchment area for, and meeting with the butters <clears throat> across the neighborhood. Um, to date, they've received 87 letters of support from residents of Dorchester, including a butters to the site. Um, they've received a letter of support from the Clam Point Civic Association, and they have continued talks with the Clam Point Civic Association, Report Adams Civic Association, and they've done outreach to the Columbia Savin Hill Civic Association. Um, we'd like to go on record in support of this. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives who wish to speak regarding this application? Yes, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Julie Ryan from City Councilor Frank Baker's office. This applicant has engaged the community multiple times. Not only did they have the city sponsored abutters meeting, they had their own abutters meeting as well. It was overall well received by the community and had no strong opposition. The community was in favor of the Chavez brothers having them being stakeholders in the neighborhood already. With that being said, the council would like to go on record in support of this proposal. 
Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application? As a reminder, please limit your testimony to two minutes. Is there any? Hi. Hi, this is Desiree Frangel. I'm the community outreach. I want to thank you guys for um, hearing us out today. I just want to clarify briefly an earlier testimony um, that was meant for our behalf. Um, her name is Perpetual Hafron. She lives on 39 Fenton Street, and I believe that she testified on our behalf, but when the location um, over in Chinatown was being presented. So I do apologize for that confusion. She was in the middle of work, but she supports us and I can have her email you guys um, later today, if necessary. Thank, Thank you. you. Desiree, if you could ask her just so that we can also clarify that for the record on the uh, testimony regarding the initial application. Thank you. I will. Thank you. Are there any other individuals who wish to testify? Seeing none, Chairwoman Joyce, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? I don't, thank you. Commissioner Smith? Commissioner Holmes? No, thank you. Commissioner Lombos? Commissioner St. Kean? No. The board will take this matter under advisement and will vote on it this coming Wednesday. The record will be kept open until Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Calling Sierra Naturals, Inc. The proposed license premise is 827 to 829 Boylston Street. The license type is Retail Recreational Cannabis Dispensary License. The proposed hours of operation are Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sunday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Equity status, non-equity applicant. Date of initial application, August 22, 2018. Date of filing with Inspectional Services, August 22, 2018. Date of community meeting, April 8, 2019. Presentation team consists of David Rosenberg, co-founder, president, and board member, Lewis Carger, co-founder, treasurer, and board member, Duan Packnett, vice president of government relations and community investment, Michael Foley, regional dispensary manager, Christian Rainier, attorney for landlord, and Yari Sanchez, attorney for landlord. The applicant present? Yes. As a reminder, you will have 10 minutes. Jasmine Wynn will notify you at the five-minute mark and the two-minute mark. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Dwan Packnett. I live in Brighton and I'm VP of Government Relations and Community Investment. Next slide, please. Just give me one moment. Okay. <laughs> Getting ahead of me. I, well, I am joined today by David Rosenberg and Luke Carger, our original co-founders, president and treasurer respectively, and owners of 829 Boylston Street. Michelle Foley, next slide, please. Michelle Foley, Sierra's Regional Dispensary Manager, and our attorneys, Chadi Sanchez, Chris Rainier from Goulston and & Stores, and John Fernandez, our State Regulatory Counsel. Next slide, please. Founded in 2013, Sierra Naturals is one of Massachusetts' first vertically integrated medical companies and has become one of the state's largest cannabis employers. Our growth has been thoughtful and with purpose. We voluntarily unionized our workforce, becoming the first and only Massachusetts cannabis company to do so. We are the only cannabis operator with zero incidents and zero deficiencies in six years of operation. In fact, our facilities are used by the CCC as the training ground for our state partners and inspectors. And most important to me, and why I am so proud to be a member of the CIRA leadership team, is CIRA's commitment to diversity and inclusion as a core value driving our success. We created the first in the state accelerator program to support economic empowerment applicants. We co-founded Cultivate It, the first in the nation jail to jobs, higher education and cannabis industry workforce training program. And in partnership with UFCW 1445, we are creating a union apprenticeship program to build a diverse workforce to fuel our future. This is why Sir Naturals is an important alternative point of entry to the cannabis industry for people of color. Sierra's secure living wage, union jobs, operational structure, and local management offers a broad range of jobs and opportunities for advancement, often unique to publicly traded companies. And the reason why companies like IBM and Coca-Cola have historically played such an important role to people of color. 
slide seven, please. By viewing the cannabis industry as an economic engine for enormous and equitable community benefit, we are radically rethinking community engagement. We recognize that individuals from any community want meaningful opportunities to define their own destinies, historically and sadly, an elusive goal for many people of color. By gaining critical hands-on, on-the-job training, we are building a workforce that will develop skills distinct to this regulated industry, allowing those from disproportionately impacted communities to gain valuable experience. They can then take those same skills to do anything they choose, becoming limited only by their imaginations and not by their opportunities. This ability to move up the ladder or across the country for better opportunities, or both, is true economic independence and mobility. And on top of that, these skilled workers will now have a union that will follow and support them wherever they choose to go. That's why we have created CIRA Community, a three-phased equity-driven diversity and inclusion and employment program. Next slide, please. We begin with, you can't be what you can't see. A series of community outreach meetings conducted in disproportionately impacted neighborhoods in Boston. We seek to deconstruct the stigma of cannabis by confronting head on the complicated and racist history of cannabis in the United States. We describe the basics of our industry and we explore the many opportunities for careers within the industry and at CIRA. Then we move to the second phase, workforce development or there is a place for you in the cannabis industry. Partnering with UFCW, our employees now have guaranteed access to living wage and portable union jobs, the type of skilled jobs that carry good pay, great benefits and educational opportunities. In phase three, we empower entrepreneurs through our Accelerator 2.0 program. CIRA Fellows, all economic empowerment applicants, receive hands-on mentorship and training to open retail stores across the state while gaining access to CIRA's manufacturing and distribution know-how. That's why we are delighted to share that the CCC just recently granted three licenses to CIRA Fellows with the first store, Western, Western Front, Front, scheduled to open later this month. We couldn't be more pleased. Slide 14, please. We've created a Boston First Boston program, program to give local hiring preference to Boston residents with a goal of 75% of our Boylston store employees coming from the city, with particular focus on recruiting from disproportionately impacted neighborhoods in Boston. We plan to hire 60% people of color and 50% women. Slide 20, please. But in order to recruit, hire, and retain a workforce that reflects Boston, we must first invest in our future employees' neighborhoods in Boston. That's why we will be contributing a grand total of over $475,000 per year throughout the entire city of Boston in both cash and in-kind contributions. We know how important it is to put Boston communities first. Next slide, please. We have received broad and significant support for this proposal, including our, elect our elected and community leaders like Representative Jay Livingstone and the UFCW, IBEW, the AFL-CIO, and even several of our butters. Next slide, please. CIRA is committed to fitting into the iconic Back Bay neighborhood. We are members of the Licensing and Business Unit Committee of NAB and the Back Bay Association, and we look forward to holding quarterly community meetings to receive community feedback and exchange ideas. Thank you. Michelle? Thank you, Juan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Foley, CIRA's Regional Dispensary Manager, and I've been successfully managing CIRA's retail operations for the past three years. Um, I have over 20 years of high volume retail management and eight of those years spent running a retail store on Newbury Street in the Back Bay. Um, thank you for your time today. Slide 24, please. Our location is directly across from the Prudential Towers. As an experienced operator, we take our retail responsibility very seriously we must meet the highest expectations, especially with this location. 829 Boylston Street is informed by Sarah's extensive experience and intentional design principles. 
Our facility is located at the basement level and is purposefully constructed to be modest, inconspicuous, safe, and secure. There will be no outdoor queuing, regular security sweeps, and our experienced staff minimize any disruption to the surrounding commercial areas. For all of these reasons, we're very proud to have the endorsement of the Back Bay Association, local area businesses, including our direct abutter for our application. Sierra is the gold standard in operations and we're the right operator to thoughtfully develop a location in this area. Slide 28, please. Our security measures meet or exceed all standards for financial banks and financial institutions. This means that Sierra will be one of the safest locations on Boylston Street. Uh, Two minute warning. Repeating that over six years of operations, we've had zero incidents for theft, diversion, or public nuisance. And finally, we voluntarily committed to selling only inseparable packs of four pre rolls, creating higher price points. The goal being to replicate the wildly successful tobacco prevention program as a way to further reduce the diversion of cannabis products. And our sincere hope is that we set the example for cannabis retailers statewide to implement the same principles. Will be appointment only when we launch, and this is not new to us as we're already successfully uh, appointment only in Needham and Somerville. We have a strict zero tolerance policy banning any customer who violates our safety or security policy from all Sierra stores. Slide 33, please. We understand that our customers will primarily come from the surrounding neighborhood and will want to walk, ride, or take any number of public transit options in the area. This is why our Boylston Street location was specifically chosen. Extensive parking options are also available around the store. We're a short walk to the Green Line, the Orange Line, the commuter rail, uh, over half a dozen bike routes, and there's a blue bike station right in front of our store. Sierra currently subsidizes MBTA uh, passes and blue bikes memberships for all of our employees. So we'll be taking full advantage of the unparalleled public transit options this area has to offer. Thank you. And this time I'll hand it back over to Dwan for closing. Slide 36, please. In closing, Sierra Naturals is the first and only uni union cannabis employer in Massachusetts. We will with intent and purpose engage disproportionately impacted communities through targeted programs and investment. And we are the gold standard in operational ex excellence with a zero incident and zero de deficiency track record that our regulators look to. We thank you for your time and we are here to answer your questions. Do you have any questions for the applicant? I, do. I couldn't hear you, Leslie. Did you say me? Do you have any questions for the applicant? Sorry, you're cutting out. Yes. Um, you testified that you have um, appointment only in Needham and Somerville. How long have they been open and operating? So our Needham location has been open since February of 2018. Um, and we actually have been operating appointment only since that location has been open. Um, and the Somerville location opened in uh, September of 2017. Um, and we actually implemented appointment only uh, when COVID hit. Um, we were trying to, you know, make sure that we uh, limited the impact to the community, no lines forming, that we uh, limited the number of, of, of customers, or I should say patients inside the building. So we've been operating um, since March uh, in, in Somerville, appoint successfully appointment only. Okay, so how do you come up with that formula that one of them has been appointment only since February 2018 and the other one was only began doing appointment only since COVID hit? What would you, and what would you expect for this location? How long do you think you'd be appointment only? Um, yeah, so I, I guess the first part of that question is um, the, the, the Needham special permit requires us to operate appointment only, so uh, that dictated, you know, the operations there, um, and as I said during COVID, that's kind of where we, uh, you know, implemented that to just, just help streamline the operations and make sure that people were, you know, or, you know, limited the number of people inside of our store, sure. um, and so for, for Boyle, for Boyle. Uh, I would say it, it, to be determined, um, you know, we're, we're, we'll definitely start as a appointment only um, and, and see how that goes. I don't think we don't have like an actual set date yet. Um, it would determine, you know, how successful and if we feel that it's successful and we would potentially keep that um, as a way of operating. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any questions for the applicant? Just one, and excuse me if anybody finds this question naive because I don't understand it. What do you mean 
to buy inseparable four packs. They, ha I, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so that means like a basically like a pre-rolled uh, joint. Um, we would sell them in packs of of minimum four, and so that what that does is that increases the price point, um, therefore deterring anyone coming in to just buy like one pre-roll. Um, Exactly. So just mimicking what the, the tobacco company is okay, doing. So yeah. inseparable is not the packaging. It means that you can't sell them separate. Correct. Oh, right. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, do you have any questions for the applicant? Just one. Um, can you talk about your training and retention policy? You said you have places to meet them in Somerville. So in terms of your diversity, can you talk about a little bit about the training and retention of employees? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a, um, a retail training manager um, and she's fantastic. So her and I uh, create all of our training materials. All of our staff go through a two to three week, um, very intensive training program, everything from you know, product to operations and regulations, customer service. Um, and we really see that as you know, the, a, a way to set people. I feel like if you set people up for success in the beginning, um, you're starting them on the right foot. Therefore, they'll be more apt to stay with the company who invests in their training. Um, and so they go through that training. Uh, they're also uh, shadowing employees after they go through the training. They'll do a week of shadowing. Um, and, and so that's what our you know, training program looks like. Uh, we're of the philosophy that training never ends. We're always creating new training materials, training documents, um, and, and, and you know, staff development is something that's ongoing. Juan, do you want to also speak to the UFCW and how that's going to um, impact our, uh, our training program and, and also our retention program? Yes, so we will also be working very closely with UFCW for an apprenticeship training program and I might also add, I'll add another thing with Cultivated. That's also a training program that we're involved in for the jails to job. And as a matter of fact, we have our first intern is starting or may have already started um, in this past month or past week actually. And the idea is that as Michelle said, to set people up for success, you wanna make sure that they get all of the opportunities training and can work together. Um, so with the, with the union, however, we're working closely to have an apprenticeship program. So the very same way that Michelle was talking about, and especially focused on people from disproportionately impacted communities. Thank you. Commissioner Lombos, do you have any questions for the applicant? Uh, Commissioner, I mean, John, Commissioner <laughs> asked already, thanks. Commissioner Sankian. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the structure. I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrap my head around the co-founder. The founders are not the financial interest in the company. It's a, is that the, is that a national company air strategies that has full financial interest? So what does that mean as David and Luis are co-founders? They just, they, cause they own the property. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to figure out how that structure works because it doesn't look like they're, Looks like they're board members. I'm just confused. All right, Commissioner, that's actually a, a very good question. So if, if I could just give you a brief history. Thank you. Um, since cannabis is illegal from a federal perspective, there's no traditional bank financing available. Mm -hmm. So when Lou and I and a, and a few other people started this company, we had to go to a private financing model. We, we raised the money from friends and family. Mm -hmm. and. That was fine in the beginning, and we were able to initially operate successfully um, with those private investments from our founding group. Um, and I just want to note at this time, of the 17 individual medical marijuana licenses originally given out in 2014, we are one of only three of those license holders that are still locally controlled, managed, or run by the original founders. Once that adult use law was signed uh, in Massachusetts, we understood that our initial investment wasn't gonna be enough to continue to grow the company and, and, and survive and thrive. And the marijuana business, quite frankly, is much more capital intensive. It requires a lot more money 
than anyone anticipated. So we began to search for the necessary capital and we figured we were gonna need between 50 and $60 million to allow us to sufficiently, uh, sufficiently expand and grow. And then we were approached by a number of different investors who wanted to take over Sierra and push us aside to run the company their way. We rejected all those inquiries that would have resulted in the original founders uh, relinquishing our local control. And finally, we were approached by an individual, Jonathan Sandelman, who studied our success and wanted to be a part of all we stood for. Someone who didn't want to take over the company, but who wanted to invest in its continued growth and success. That's where the EAR, AYR Corporate Partnership was formed and born for Sierra. 18 months ago, we agreed to swap our stock, so our ownership in Sierra, for um, stock for an ownership interest in EAR and a seat on the EAR Board of Directors, making us an in integral part of the ownership of the new parent company. And just to be clear, we took no profits out of this transaction, none. We took ownership in EAR and thereby retained ownership in Sierra. We retain our control of the policy direction of the company by maintaining control of the Sierra Board of Directors. The management team of today is the same as the management team of yesterday, other than a few normal voluntary departures and replacements of employees. The approach has been and will continue to be that the original Sierra ownership team will operate the company in a, the successful way that it's always operated the company as a local company tuned in to local needs. And Juan, I don't know if there's anything that you wanna add. I certainly would. I'd like to jump in here because I think it's important that the board hear what all of this means to communities. What David just said about our ownership means that we can do so much more with the resources that we have now. And we invest it, that ownership structures allow us to make the significant investment in diversity and inclusion, actually creating the department that I now lead. And it, it is the Department of Government Relations and Community Investment and the programs that we just heard about. And so we are going to be hiring from the neighborhood and implementing those programs. And it's because of this, these resources that we can do that. Thank you. And then I just had one final question. Um, if it, I love all of the diversity goals and, and the commitment to, to unionized workers. And I was wondering if you could uh, supply the, your stats for the other places that you operate in the state, your diversity uh, statistics for the other, for the Needham and the Somerville um, locations. Sure, uh, Michelle or, or Duan, do you wanna take that? You can I'll, supply it to me after. Oh, after okay. Okay. Yes, we definitely yeah. can. <laughs> Thank you for not having us do this. Also. Yeah, no, the, no, you can do it. The Just public meeting for next week. Yes, we, yeah. we will get them immediately. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so you, that Commission. actually is um, something we do have handy. So we can we track it, we monitor <laughs> mm -hmm. it. So we, we can get that to you ASAP for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And before we return to additional questions from the commissioners, we will open this up to public testimony. Is there anyone who wishes to speak support or opposition beginning with elected officials or their representatives? Madam Chair, members of the board, Shanice Hunzel with the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. My predecessor and our chief of staff facilitated the, the public process for this proposal. The meeting that was held in April 2019 was very productive and constituents were su supportive of the proposal. While the Kingsley School has submitted a letter of opposition on record, there is overwhelming support on record as well, including letters of support from the Backyard Association, a butter state and city level elected officials. At this time, the mayor's office has no further questions or concerns. We ask that the applicant continue to work closely with their neighbors to address any issues. Given this, we would like to go on record in support of the proposal. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives who wish to speak regarding this matter? Hi, I'd like to speak on behalf of Councillor Bach. Uh, hi, Madam Chair, members of the board. Councillor Bach submitted a letter of non-opposition for this site. This is a location preferred by the neighboring community and the ownership group has committed significant resources to the local area and has committed to a unionized workforce, all points in favor for the councillor. 
She believes that if approved, there'd be a good neighbor partner. Her main source of hesitation, however, is that this proposal is owned by a large publicly traded Canadian multinational. So it isn't the local or majority person of color ownership you would ideally wanna see at a potentially lucrative back bay site. That chief reservation is what prompted her to file a letter of non-opposition rather than support. The counselor's written letter contains a much more thorough summary of the proposal's strengths and weaknesses, and she hopes it will be useful to the commissioners as you weigh your decision. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials or their representatives? Seeing none, we will turn to individuals who have requested to testify. Again, please keep your remarks to two minutes or less. Please, once I call your name, state your address and affiliation, if any. Calling Gabriel Camacho. Calling Martin Roeder. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board and, and Leslie. My name is Martin Rutter. I live at uh, 144 Beacon Street in the Back Bay. I've lived there for 15 years. Although actually my connections with this part of the world go back somewhat uh, longer than that since my mother's forebears were expelled from here unceremoniously approximately 200 years ago. But I came back and no hard feelings. Um, <laughs> I'm authorized to speak as a former chair and a current member of the board on behalf of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay, which as I think you know, is the residence association in the Back Bay, which recently celebrated actually its 65th anniversary. Um, we've been uh, grappling and trying to get our hands around all the issues associated with the legalization of marijuana for at least uh, three years, uh, going through many changes which of course have finally led to the creation of the, of the Boston Cannabis Board. Um, at the same time, we've been in touch with various elected officials. We've been in discussions with the business community and so forth. So what we would like to say at this point is that our position is one of non-opposition to this application. We are particularly interested in the fact that it is located as compared to other locations in the Back Bay, uh, relatively far away from residences. Uh, it's on Boston Street with wide sidewalks, which is different from some of the other locations that have been proposed. We're particularly glad to hear about the appointment only approach method of operation and that there won't be any, uh, any single joints. So um, I think on the whole, um, and this has taken a lot of discussion and debate within, within NAB, we have decided to, um, I say, adopt a position of non-opposition to this application. Thank you. Thank you. Calling it Christopher Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christopher Sullivan. I'm a lawyer and a partner in the firm of Robbins Kaplan. We're located at 800 Boylston Street, uh, right across the street from this site. Uh, I represent a, another non-equity applicant called Compassionate uh, Organics. Uh, on February 22nd of 2016, um, Comp Compassionate Organics filed with then the Department of Public Health in its initial medical marijuana filing for a medical marijuana dispensary at 331 Newbury Street in the Back Bay. By two years later on- uh, Mr. Sullivan, just uh, with all due respect to, for your testimony, could you please limit your comments today to this applicant and not, well, your, not your, your other applicant? Yeah, the reason that um, I'm speaking uh, against this is the, uh, it is our position that the date of our application uh, to the uh, for this process has been misrepresented uh, or has been done in error because uh, in February of 2016 we had already filed with the Department of Public Health. Um, I can submit this argument in in a written form if that would be preferable. But the point of it is by 2018 in February of 2018 we had a non-opposition letter from the. Boston uh, City Council, 
We had a provisional certificate of registration. We had an award of a conditional use ZPA. And we had approval from the Back Bay um, Architectural Commission. And despite all of that, uh, we have been assigned a much, much later application uh, date, which we feel is incorrect. And that's basically the, the point that I'm trying to make here. And if it would be more uh, easy to digest or more persuasive, I can certainly file a uh, written that would, brief. That would, that would be helpful because today's testimony is about Sarah Naturals. I understand. And whether or not you support or oppose it, not about you know the dates of your um, the other application. We we oppose it for the reasons stated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Calling Kennel Brumstein. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kennel Brumstein, and I am a business agent with IBW Local 103 and a Boston resident. And I um, am in full support of Sierra Naturals. And I, uh, as I represent um, over 8,000 members, uh, licensed electricians in IBW Local 103. Uh, Sierra um, intends to build it with IBW workers as well as we continue, continue to work and connect with the minority contractor. Thank you. Thank you. Calling Lincoln Taggart. Yeah, thank you. My name is Lincoln Taggart and I'm the Director of Operations at Community Action Agency of Somerville. Uh, we're located at 66 through 70 uh, Union Square in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, 02143. I don't want to take too much of your time, uh, recognizing that this is, of course, a Boston and not a similar hearing. Um, but I'd like to just take a moment to say that Sierra Naturals has been a fantastic partner here to us at CAS and to reinforce how committed they are to the communities that they're in. Um, back in December of 2019, uh, we were seeking to fill a large gap in funding for our housing advocacy program. Um, Sierra stepped up and invested 51000 or uh, 17,000 over three years as a contribution towards a full-time housing advocate who, among other duties, assists low-income residents facing eviction. And to date, Sierra's support of our housing advocate position has resulted directly in 43 Somerville residents or 17 households increasing their net worth, uh, primarily through benefits enrollment, uh, 20 residents or eight households <laughs> obtaining safe and affordable housing, 65 residents or 22 households avoiding eviction, and 13 residents or five households increasing food security. Sarah's additional gift of $10,000 to the Somerville Cares Fund will provide emergency assistance to approximately 43 Somerville residents or 17 households affected by the current public health crisis. That is, that is your time. You can feel free to submit any additional comments in writing. Thank you very much. Calling Linda Champion. Hi everyone. And I apologize, my dog is asleep and snoring. But my name is Linda Champion, I'm an attorney. My role with CIRA is that I am the first appointed chair to the advisory board. Um, but my role here is not as a direct application of the application before you, Madam Chair, and the commission. Um, David Rosenberg of CIRA and I have a relationship that dates back to 2015. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, the person who is running and behind um, this entity. In 2015, Dave, without hesitation, helped my family launch an idea that through music we could bring people together and break down racial barriers. Um, we, we raised with Dave Rosenberg over um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. All of that money was given to Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. And that resulted in a free music program that was open to all the students. It created um, a fully equipped music room for BCNC. And David did this um, project without hesitation. He knows um, instinctively that working together, working within communities, building opportunities for inclusion is very important. Cannabis is an industry that is intrinsically tied to racial justice. I am a former Suffolk County Assistant District Attorney. I have seen the systematic wrongs in the prosecution of cases regarding cannabis possession and distribution. I've watched so many black and brown lives being lost to the system. I am passionate about creating opportunities for people of color to participate in this emerging market. 
Dave's compassion for people and people of color and industries um, where they open the doors to diversity and inclusion did not start with this industry. So I wanna make that very clear. Um, at his former company, he also hired men and women um, with criminal records. You would never know who in a room was that individual because he treats everyone the same with dignity, respect. Everyone who comes into his circle is treated as a very important person. That, that is time. So please feel free to submit any additional comments via email. Calling Meg Manzer Cohen. Is Meg Mainzer Cohen present? Yes, I apologize. I was trying to find a location as the sun is setting that wasn't blinding me out. Um, so I, I, I like tested out a different location, which was worse. But anyway, I'm Meg Mainzer Cohen, president of the Back Bay Association, and thank you for hearing my comments today. The Back Bay Association goes back to 2013 with trying to find the right company in the right location. To, for cannabis in the Back Bay before, before it was even legalized. And people on the call have been through many machinations with us because we really found it very hard to find the right company in the right location. And I'm here to support Sierra Naturals because we do believe that they have the right plan in the right location with the right team. They've, they've worked very hard through the process of the past, you know, close to two years to make sure that they meet with groups, with individuals, answer questions. They've really refined their proposal to you today based on feedback and comments from all of us. So I don't want anyone to faint and fall down, but we are in support of this application. And our membership has been involved and invited to the public meeting in 2019. And we have also, uh, synthesize their comments into these comments today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Calling Dan Donahue. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, I'm Joyce, and members of the court. My name is Dan Donahue. I'm the president of Saunders Hotel Group, which oversees the Lennox, which is a very hard baseball throw away from uh, where the proposed site is. And three years ago, if you would have thought, if I would have thought, excuse me, of supporting a uh, cannabis in the Back Bay, I would have bet you everything I have that we wouldn't do it. In meeting with Sierra Naturals, uh, their community focus, their, their neighborhood, their true genuine neighborhood approach to where they're working and who they're, who they're working with and for um, has been unbelievable. And, you know, I, I, I look to the fact that they are, you know, in Back Bay, they are in Boylston, but they're tucked away in a, in a subterrain location. I think it makes a perfect spot uh, to both serve our community and the guests which we serve. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application? Yes, I would. My name is Edward Borash. I'm the owner of Sir Speedy Printing, directly above where uh, Sarah Natural wants to go. And um, I've been here for 41 years now. And over the 41 years, I've been in this building that's never really had any work done to it. Maybe about three years ago, uh, Dave Rosenberg and Lou Cargo bought the building. And in doing so, they came to me in my other uh, retail or next door supercuts and had spoken to us many times throughout the whole process to make sure we were happy as everything was going down. So, so far, my experience with these guys has been incredible. They've uh, redone our building. Our building used to have a picture of it down in the um, Boston Redevelopment is probably the worst building in the Back Bay. Now I think it's probably one of the best after these guys bought it. Uh, Dave um, uh, Rosenberg seemed to be like such an upright guy that I asked you because he's always donating to different charities and things of that sort I actually asked him if I could get involved in something that he does and so now every year there's a home up in Salem with about 25 boys that are misplaced 
And so every year, Christmas and Thanksgiving, with Dave, we donate the, donate the dinners together. And my family brings it up there. And I, I just want to say, this guy coming into our community is such a huge plus. And again, I'm right above it. So if anybody's going to be affected by it, it's going to be me. Okay? And that's because of people coming or whatever. I think, you know, doing a lot of hard thought, I think bringing the people to the neighborhood, you know, closer to us to get this, be probably mostly back bay people, but anybody that does come from outside is a huge plus for us because I feel like we're going to lose the Heinz Auditorium. And in that so, the back bay is going to lose a ton of business, all the businesses here. And we don't want any more businesses closing because there's enough closing right now because of COVID. We need to really strengthen our neighborhood. And I, I truly believe this would really strengthen the neighborhood. And also, I wanted to commend you guys on the commission because I've been watching for the last few hours. And I think you guys are doing a terrific job. I really do. And you should all clap yourself from the back one time and give yourself a pat on the back for what you're doing for the city. But I guess that's it. If anybody needs to ask me questions about anything, you can. Thank you, Edward. We greatly appreciate it. That is time. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application? Yes, please. Um, good afternoon. I thank you very much for a few minutes of your time, a few seconds of your time. Uh, my name is Laura O'Callaghan, and I am the, uh, I'm the president and CEO of the Milford Area Chamber of Commerce. And we're located in Milford. Um, and I do recognize that this is a Boston license consideration, but you know, I did want to give you some perspective of what it's like to have Sierra Naturals in our town since they moved in in 2014 just simply said they're an exceptional corporate neighbor. They really are. You know, as an employer, it was very important for them to hire, you know, the local talent. Uh, with something that really impressed me was they put the effort of, you know, putting together a breakfast, an information breakfast for all the local businesses to get together so they could inform them on, you know, the different vendors that they need um, and they need to work for them. Um, it just shows that they wanted to keep the work local. Um, they're also very community focused, not just monetarily, their employees volunteer their time at the local nonprofits. You know, they'll reach out to me and uh, at the chamber here and, you know, they'll see who, who needs help in the community and then we'll, we'll make the connections for them. One, one thing that I loved about them too is back in March, at the beginning of the pandemic, they, you know, they saw the need for the PPEs in our local hospital and, you know, they realized that they had the capability and the know-how to produce hand sanitizers at their facilities. So they got to work immediately and they donated the much needed sanitizer. So needless to say, our community were, you know, they got, they got high fives and thumbs up for that one. Um, but that's just snippets of what they've done and what they continue to do in here in our, in our community. And just to finish it up, you know, I'm incredibly honored to have had them on our board of directors and, and grateful, really grateful that they chose Milford as one of their locations and they've been nothing but an incredible neighbor. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Calling Jody Mendoza. Hello, thank you. I would like to speak in support of CIRA and relate my experiences uh, with the Accelerator 2.0, which is a program that they had mentioned briefly. Um, my name is Jody Mendoza, representing Team Green um, at 1292 Blue Hill Avenue in Mattapan. I have an economic empowerment certification from the Cannabis Control Commission. My journey in cannabis and the business of cannabis began um, in 2017. By 2018, I was one of the first in line to get certified and begin this process, which um, turned out to be a lot more difficult than anyone expected. Um, at the time, nobody knew what getting a license really entailed. Um, I went to 1010 Mass Ave. I was told that cannabis was still illegal, so I was at the wrong place. Um, I could tell you a lot of anecdotes, but I think what is really um, important is to talk about CIRA and how that changed my experience. Um, it was difficult as I struggled um, through navigating my way through the application process, through everything. Um, it was demoralizing. It was um, extremely time consuming. And it, it's just I didn't always know um, what it was that the CCC was looking for. And I would have given, um, you know, I, it was like a dream come true to all of a sudden have this opportunity to connect with people who have industry expertise and are willing to share that in industry expertise. 
being someone who doesn't have access to financing um, such as what Sira has, um, it was very, uh, it was tremendously helpful, but it also tells you something about who they are as a company. And the fact that even though I was trying to open up a dispensary in Boston, granted a different location, but still in Boston, and they um, chose to not only to help me in every which way and um, once our dispensary gets open, um, you know, there are so many concerns that you have as somebody as a first time going into a business and Sira has been very helpful to, um, to answer those questions and guide me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application? Um, Madam Chair, uh, Dennis Benzen, please. Go ahead, Mr. Benzin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good evening, um, uh, fellow commissioners. <clears throat> My name is Dennis Benzin. I am a resident of 99 uh, Bailey Road in Watertown. I am a practicing attorney. I'm also the owner of La Fabrica Central Restaurant in Cambridge, uh, Caribbean Cuisine uh, Restaurant, and uh, co-owner and LLC manager of the Western Front. Uh, an economic empowerment uh, company that is in the cannabis space. Uh, and so I'm here to speak in support of uh, Sarah, uh, but in particular to speak a little bit about uh, the support um, that they provided uh, the Western Front as an economic empowerment applicant. Um, as many of you know, um, over 120 somewhat economic empowerment applicants were certified in the state of Massachusetts about um, a year and a half, two years ago. And only one has been operating in Boston as Pure Oasis, and uh, we're in the pipeline to hopefully be the second to begin operations in a couple of weeks. And I will say that, you know, had it not been for the uh, support that we have received from Sarah, uh, it would have been nearly impossible uh, for us to be where we are today. Um, that support um, has uh, included, um, you know, working with their wholesale department, um, working with uh, the executive um, uh, group within uh, Sierra Natural, uh, Lou Carter, and working with government relations, Duan, uh, and working with uh, the retail uh, department uh, in Michelle. Uh, they have really helped us um, to uh, get to uh, the finish line. Um, what also impresses me about Sierra is the fact that they are truly committed to hiring within their own company, uh, people of color. I am one of the few Latinos uh, in the cannabis space uh, and uh, we heard recently, uh, just uh, just before me from Jody Mendoza, who's also another uh, fellow Latina that is working within the cannabis space. It is incredibly difficult uh, to get uh, your doors open as a cannabis company in the state of Massachusetts, especially if you are a minority. And without the support of companies that have set an example for what large companies um, should be doing in the state of Massachusetts to support minority companies, um, it, we would not be where we are today. And so I want to to depends on that is time please feel free to submit any additional comments in writing is there anyone else who wishes to testify regarding this application being no one we will return to the board for questions chairwoman joyce do you have any additional questions for the applicant thanks leslie i do and i just want to pick up um, on an answer um, to the question that commissioner alejandro sankian proposed uh, maybe it's for Mr. Rosenberg. Um, have there been any changes to the controlling ownership of the company since you first applied? So there have there has not because we still have the majority of the board seats. Uh, we control okay. four out of five of the board seats, so there has not been any change in controlling ownership. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holmes, do you have any additional questions for the applicant? Uh, no, not at this time. Commissioner Smith, do you have any additional questions? Thank you, Leslie, not at this time. Thank you. Commissioner Lombos? No, thank you. Commissioner Sankian? No, thank you. And seeing none, the board will take this matter under advisement. It will vote on it on Wednesday of next week. As a reminder, the record will be kept open for testimony until Wednesday at 10 a.m. Thank you all very much for participating and for attending today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.